it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible and you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. I'm reading from The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe by Edward Hendry. Introduction. This book reveals the mother of all conspiracies. It will set forth biblical proof and irrefutable evidence that will cause the scales to fall from your eyes and reveal the truth that the world you thought existed is a myth. The book addresses hard facts, not fanciful theories. An honest man who is shown to be wrong must either admit his error or cease to be honest. There are many so-called scientists and theologians who have made accommodations for falsehood. In order to keep their station in life, they have compromised their integrity and knelt in fealty to mammon in the praise of men. George Orwell stated that, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. We live in such a time. The most universally accepted deceit today is the ingrained teaching that the earth is a globe spinning at a speed of approximately 1,000 miles per hour at the equator, while at the same time orbiting the sun at approximately 67,000 miles per hour. While the earth is orbiting and spinning, the sun, in turn, is supposed to be hurtling through the Milky Way galaxy at approximately 500,000 miles per hour. The Milky Way galaxy is itself alleged to be racing through space at a speed ranging from 300,000 to 1,340,000 miles per hour. What most people are not told is that all of this spinning, orbiting, and speeding through space have never been proven. Indeed, those hypothesized movements and speeds are completely made up. In fact, every scientific experiment that has ever been performed to determine the motion of the Earth has proven that the Earth is completely stationary. Yet, scientific textbooks ignore the scientific proof that contradicts the myth of an orbiting and spinning Earth. The quote, Christian churches 
have gone along with the deception and teach in their, quote, Christian schools, a heliocentric solar system with a spinning and orbiting Earth, even though the Bible clearly states that the Earth does not move and is not a globe. How could this deception have been so complete as to include both the scientific world and the, quote, Christian churches? Why would the scientific world go along with a falsehood that has been proven to be wrong? Why would the, quote, Christian churches go along with a myth that is contrary to the Bible. This book will explain why and how it happened. The deception of a spherical spinning earth is the foundation for Darwinian evolution, Freudian psychoanalysis, and Marxist communism. Indeed, the progressive emergence of the Sodomite subculture into a government-protected, privileged class is the direct result of the prevailing theory of heliocentrism, the sun at the center of a solar system. How so, you ask? It is quite simple. To remove the Earth as the center of God's creation and accept in its place an Earth that is just one of millions of wandering planets in the universe, removes man as God's unique creation made in his image. Once the centrality of the earth in God's creation is removed, it is only a small half step further to remove the existence of God himself from the minds of men. Once God is removed from man's consciousness, then also is removed the authority of God's word and his law. Man is then enthroned, being a law unto himself. The common thread running through heliocentricity, evolution, psychology, and communism is that there is no God. Indeed, Atheism is logically a necessary element for each of those man-made philosophies to stand. The sodomite privileged class springs from a godless generation with no fear of God. Indeed, they must necessarily reject the God of the Bible because within the Bible is found God's condemnation of sodomy. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Leviticus 18.22 That sin is so abhorrent to God that he rained fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah for that filthy sin. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Genesis 19.24 Nowadays, however, sodomy is viewed as a protective lifestyle, with the U.S. Supreme Court judging sodomy a good thing, even to the degree of creating a right for same-sex couples to get married. God curses those who call the sin of sodomy good. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5.20 The communist collective ideal is based upon larceny. It uses the government to redistribute wealth. That cannot be done if the government accepted the existence of God. 
If God were to be accepted, then necessarily God's commandments must be then obeyed. The government would have a hard time justifying taking money from one group of persons for the benefit of another group of persons when faced with God's commandment, Thou shall not steal. Exodus 20, 15 Using the government as an intermediary does not make the stealing any more justifiable. Like communism, Darwinian evolution is necessarily atheistic and cannot stand if the authority of the Bible is accepted. The Bible makes it clear that God created man in his image, not after the image of an ape. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 27. Heliocentrism destroyed the landmark of geocentrism. Heliocentrism laid the groundwork for Darwinism. Once Darwinian evolution settled in, it was time for the planting of Marxist communism. In 1860, Karl Marx stated the following about Darwin's book on the origin of species, which announced the theory of evolution. Although it is developed in the crude English style, this is a book which contains the basis of natural history for our views. After allowing the theory of evolution to ferment in his mind for the next 17 years, in 1867, Marx brought forth to the world his economic philosophy based upon godless Darwinism, titled Das Kapital. Marx sent a copy of his new book to Charles Darwin, inscribed with the following, To Charles Darwin, from a devoted admirer, Karl Marx, 1873. In October 1873, Charles Darwin wrote to Karl Marx the following letter of thank you for the inscribed book sent to him by Marx. Dear Sir, I thank you for the honor which you have done me by sending me your great work on capital, and I heartily wish that I was more worthy to receive it by understanding more of the deep and important subject of political economy. Though our studies have been so different, I believe that we both earnestly desire the extension of knowledge and that this is in the long run sure to add to the happiness of mankind. I remain, dear sir, yours faithfully, Charles Darwin. The synergism between Darwin's godless evolution and Marx's godless communism is evidenced by the fact that in 1959, the communist regime in the Soviet Union struck a coin and printed a stamp in honor of the 150th anniversary of Darwin's birth, 1809. Sigmund Freud based his theories of psychoanalysis on the premise that there is no God. In his The Future of an Illusion, he described belief in God as a collective neurosis. He called it, quote, longing for a father. Psychology is essentially religion without God. Like all man-made religions, there are schisms. There are over 200 different theories of psychology, Freudian psychoanalysis being only one of them. Heliocentrism is truly the mother of all conspiracies. 
none of the other Satan-inspired, man-made philosophies would ever dare be presented without the geocentric landmark first being removed by the general acceptance of heliocentrism. Heliocentrism is the keystone to the deception. Remove that keystone and the entire edifice of deception will fall. With that keystone in place, the satanic source of the deception is inscrutable, and the facade of scientific authority for the satanic philosophies remains believable. The importance of heliocentrism to Satan's plan for world domination is why it is introduced at the earliest stage possible in the education of students. From the first day in government schools, the foundational scientific truth presented to a student is a globe of the earth that can spin on a pedestal. Heliocentrism is repeatedly reinforced throughout a student's scientific education. Heliocentrism is the most glaring example of mass mind control. To control the masses, heliocentrism must be introduced early and often so that it becomes a deeply ingrained belief. While at the same time, belief in a flat earth is always portrayed by the educational authorities as evidence of abject ignorance and even insanity. Each of the satanic philosophies of the world, heliocentrism, communism, evolution, psychology, are necessary cogs in the new world order, which is an ancient transgenerational conspiracy. There is nothing new about the New World Order. The New World Order conspiracy is a conspiracy against God and man and began in heaven and continues today on earth. And there was war in heaven Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. Satan was cast out of heaven. He then gathered with his minions on earth and began his war against God and man anew. And when the dragon saw that he was cast upon the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 12, 13 and 17. The target of Satan's malevolence is the true church of Jesus Christ. Satan has a secret army of devil-possessed adversaries of Christ who do Satan's bidding in working to suppress the gospel of Jesus Christ and enslave the world. In order to achieve those ends, Satan must control the minds of the masses. He must enslave our minds before he can enslave our bodies. Heliocentrism is the foundational belief for enslaving the minds of men. 
Satan's goal is a world government under his control. His minions call it a new world order. One of Satan's minions is President George H.W. Bush. In his January 29, 1991 State of the Union speech before a joint session of Congress, President Bush brazenly announced his efforts toward a new world order. Quote, What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future. The purpose of the heliocentric model is to hide the existence of God. This book will not only prove that heliocentrism is false, it will go further and prove that God created a stationary, flat earth that is the center of his creation, just as stated in the Bible. You will come to understand that God is real and he is watching. I'm reading from the book, The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe, by Edward Hendry. Chapter 1. Samuel Robotham Proved the Earth is Flat. Evidence that the Earth is flat is all around us. For example, if the Earth were round, then the curvature of the earth would be manifested in the physical landscape. But we do not see any curvature of the earth. The earth's circumference is purported to be 24,901 miles at the equator. That means that the horizon should drop from sight at the rate of 8 inches per mile distance squared. Samuel Burley Robotham, 1816 to 1884, who went by the nom de plume of Parallax in 1881, explained the principle in his book, Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe. Quote, if the earth is a globe and is 25,000 English statute miles in circumference, the surface of all standing water must have a certain degree of convexity. Every part must be an arc of a circle. From the summit of any such arc there will exist a curvature or declination of eight inches in the first statute mile. In the second mile, the fall will be 32 inches. In the third mile, 72 inches or six feet, as shown in the following diagram. In Cambridge County, England, there is an artificial canal called the Old Bedford. It is approximately 20 miles in length. Robotham arranged to have a boat with a flag on it that was exactly five feet above the surface of the water. The boat was rowed to Welney Bridge, which was exactly six statute miles in a straight line from Robotham, who had waded into the water. 
Rowbotham stood in the middle of the canal with a telescope exactly eight inches above the surface of the water. In looking through the eyepiece of the telescope and observing the receding boat during the whole period required to sail to Welney Bridge, quote, the flag and the boat were distinctly visible throughout the whole distance, close quote. If the earth were round, as it is supposed, the flag should not have been visible to Robotham. The boat and flag should have been 11 feet 8 inches below the horizon as depicted in the diagram below. Robotham explains the depiction in the diagram above. Quote, Let AB represent the arc of water six miles long and AC the line of sight. The point of contact with the arc would be at T, a distance of one mile from the observer at A. From T to the bridge at B would be five miles, and the curvature from T to B would be 16 feet 8 inches. The top of the flag on the boat, which was 5 feet high, would have been 11 feet 8 inches below the horizon T, and altogether out of sight. Such a condition was not observed." Close quote. Robotham was able to see the flag and boat for the entire six-mile journey in the canal, all the way to the bridge, as depicted in the diagram below. The fact that Robotham was able to see the flag and boat for the entire six miles proves that the Earth is flat. Robotham did many similar experiments at the canal that all proved that there was no curvature of the Earth. The formula for the expected drop per mile is m squared times 8 equals d, where m is the number of miles from the observer at ground level, 8 is the number of inches dropped per mile squared, and d is the distance of the drop over the horizon. The above equation assumes an Earth with a circumference of 24,901 miles. The validity of the formula m squared times 8 equals d can be verified by using the Pythagorean theorem. Under the Pythagorean theorem, the length of any side of a right triangle can be determined if one knows the length of the other two sides. The formula for the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a, b, and c are the three sides of a right triangle. In the graphic below, this author used the Pythagorean theorem to determine the drop below the horizon at a distance of 50 miles. The answer using the Pythagorean theorem is exactly the same answer through the formula of m squared times 8 equals d. To find the drop from the horizon at a distance of 50 miles, we would take the miles squared multiplied times 8 inches per our formula above m squared times 8 equals d. Assuming a 50-mile distance, 
we get 50 squared times 8 equals 20,000 inches, 1,666 feet. Converting the 20,000 inches, 1,666 feet to miles, we get a drop of 0.32 miles. The radius of the Earth is determined to be 3,963 miles. The radius of the Earth is determined through the formula of R equals C divided by the product of 2 times pi, where pi is 3.14159, R is the radius, and C is the circumference. The number pi is a mathematical constant that is based upon the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. To arrive at pi, simply divide a circle's circumference by its diameter. All circles, no matter their size, have the same ratio of their circumference to their diameter of 3.14159. Pi is an irrational number that never ends. 3.14159 only carries pi out to the fifth decimal place, but it in fact continues indefinitely. If the circumference of the Earth at the equator is taken to be, as alleged, 24,901 miles, that would mean that the Earth's radius is 24,901 divided by the product of 3.14159 times 2, which equals 3,963 miles. For some reason, the alleged radius of the Earth is published by many authorities to be 3,959 miles. That, however, cannot be correct according to the geometric equation for determining the radius of a circle. This author will use the figure of 3,963 miles obtained from the equation for the radius of the Earth. The difference of four miles between the two figures does not make a material difference in our conclusions. Using the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we can easily determine the length of the hypotenuse side C. Side A is the radius of the Earth, 3,963 miles. Side B is 50 miles, which means that side C is 3,963.32 miles. If we subtract the known radius of the Earth from the length of the hypotenuse, side C, we can confirm that the drop below the horizon at a distance of 50 miles from a supposedly globular Earth is 0.32 miles. That is the exact same figure we obtained using the formula m squared times 8 equals d thus confirming the validity of that formula. Below is a chart that gives the results of the equation m squared times 8 equals d for the expected drop per mile assuming an earth with a circumference of 24,901 miles. m 
is the number of miles from the observer at ground level, 8 is the number of inches dropped per mile squared, and D is the distance of the drop over the horizon. This is a reading from the book, The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe, by Edward Hendry. Chapter 3. Water Not Convex Proves Earth Is Not a Globe. Water always seeks its own level, because water is always level. Water cannot be anything but perfectly flat. There is never any convexity to water as would be required by a globular earth. All oceans, seas, and lakes are perfectly level. No matter what configuration you pour water into, it is always level. It is an irrefutable physical reality that can be replicated by anyone. Eric Dubé, in his book, The Flat Earth Conspiracy, quotes an engineer whose job it was to construct canals and railways. The engineer explained that no allowance is made for the supposed curvature of the earth. Why not? Because the earth is flat. Engineer W. Winkler wrote into the Earth Review, October 1893, regarding the Earth's supposed curvature, stating, quote, As an engineer of many years standing, I saw that this absurd allowance is only permitted in school books. No engineer would dream of allowing anything of the kind. I have projected many miles of railways and many more of canals, and the allowance has not even been thought of, much less allowed for. This allowance for curvature means this, that it is eight inches for the first mile of a canal, and increasing at the ratio by the square of the distance in miles. That's a small navigable canal for boats, say 30 miles long, will have, by the above rule, an allowance for a curvature of 600 feet. Think of that, and then please credit engineers as not being quite such fools. Nothing of the sort is allowed. We no more think of allowing 600 feet for a line of 30 miles of railway or canal than of wasting our time trying to square the circle. The Suez Canal is just one example that stands as irrefutable proof that the Earth is flat. The canal runs for 100 miles. There are no locks in the canal. It is perfectly level for the entire 100 miles. If the Earth were a globe, each end of the canal would necessarily be over one mile below the horizon from the other end. That would mean that the middle of the canal would be elevated in a round hump, 1,666 feet in the midpoint of the canal. However, that is not the case. David Wardlaw Scott, in his book Terra Firma, explained, The distance between the Red Sea at Suez and the Mediterranean Sea is 100 statute miles, the datum line of the canal being 26 feet below the level of the Mediterranean, and is continued horizontally the whole way from sea to sea, there not being a single lock on the canal. 
the surface of the water being parallel with the datum line. It is thus clear that there is no curvature or globularity for the whole hundred miles between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Had there been, according to the astronomic theory, the middle of the canal would have been 1,666 feet higher than at either end, whereas the canal is perfectly horizontal for the whole distance. I'm reading from The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe, by Edward Hendry. Chapter 4. The Earth is Flatter Than a Pancake. Of course, land with its mountains and valleys is not perfectly level, as is water. However, when large, expansive areas of land are considered, it can be determined that land is not convex, as would be expected on a spherical Earth. Land is generally flat. Scientific research proves that fact. For example, Mark Fonstad, Ph.D., William Pugach and Brandon Vogt, Ph.D., used data from the United States Geological Survey to determine that, on scale, the state of Kansas is literally flatter than a pancake. On a scale where one is perfectly flat, the geographers used a confocal laser to determine that a pancake had a measured flatness of 0.957. The state of Kansas was scaled down using a 1 to 250,000 scale digital elevation model, DEM. Kansas was found to have a measured flatness of 0.9997. Fonstadt et al. compared transections of a pancake and the east-west profile of merged relief data from the state of Kansas. The pancake used by Fonstadt et al. was obtained from an International House of Pancakes restaurant. Its relief was measured at 2 millimeters over a diameter of 130 millimeters. Relief means the quantitative measurement of vertical elevation change in a landscape over a given area. For an area of land, the relief can be obtained by subtracting its highest point in elevation from its lowest point. A simple way to compare the relief of two transected profiles of different sizes is to divide the relief by the length of the transection. The resulting relief quotient can be used to compare the relief of the two transected profiles. The lower the relief quotient, the flatter is the area. The relief quotient for the pancake in the Fonstadt et al. research project was 0.015. That's 2 divided by 130, which equals 0.015. The highest point in the state of Kansas is 4,039 feet above sea level, and the lowest point is 679 feet above sea level. The relief for Kansas, therefore, is 3,360 feet, or 0.64 miles. The east-west transection of Kansas is 400 miles across, 
resulting in an approximate relief quotient of 0 0.0016. That's 0.64 divided by 400, which equals 0 0.0016. The comparison of relief quotients confirms the results obtained by Fondstadt et al. Kansas is by far flatter than a pancake. Jerome Dobson, president of the American Geographical Society and professor of geography at the University of Kansas, and Joshua Campbell, geographer and GIS architect in the Office of the Geographer and Global Issues at the United States Department of States, came to the defense of the state of Kansas. They did not want people to think that Kansas was flat and boring. Dobson and Campbell concluded that, according to the research study of Dr. Fonstadt et al., in order for Kansas not to be flatter than a pancake over its 400-mile span, would require Kansas to have a mountain that is 32,506 feet, approximately six miles above sea level. 400 miles times 0 0.015 relief quotient for a pancake equals six miles. Such a six mile high mountain would be approximately 10 times the actual variation in terrain in Kansas and taller than the tallest mountain in the world, which is Mount Everest at 29,029 feet above sea level. If the Earth were a globe, Kansas would have a bulging arc more than 52,800 feet, that's 10 miles above sea level. That would exceed the needed height above sea level to not be considered flatter than a pancake by four miles. The fact that the maximum relief in Kansas is only 3,360 feet means that there is no such bulging arc. The study by Dr. Fonstad et al. has far-reaching implications not lost on geographers. Lee Allison, the director of the Kansas Geological Survey, concluded from that research study that, quote, everything on Earth is flatter than a pancake as they measured it, close quote. Dr. Dobson performed additional research on the issue of the flatness of Kansas. Dr. Dobson was joined in his research by Joshua Campbell. Dobson and Campbell used a different methodology than did Dr. Fonstad et al. But their research confirmed the results of Dr. Fonstad et al. Most notably, Dobson and Campbell found that the entire United States was flatter than a pancake. Dobson and Campbell further discovered that Florida, Illinois, North Dakota, Louisiana, Minnesota, and Delaware were all flatter than Kansas. Flatness ranking map for states prepared by Jerome Dobson and Joshua Campbell as published in The Atlantic. Dr. Dobson extrapolated from his own confirmatory research that the entire world is flatter than a pancake. Dr. Dobson had this to say about the research study by Dr. Fonstad et al. Quote, Our own findings did not refute their conclusions about Kansas, but rather proved that their conclusion applies to the whole world. 
Dr. Dobson's research was published in the Geographical Review, a peer-reviewed journal published by the American Geographical Society. Neither Dobson and Campbell's findings, nor those of Dr. Fonstadt et al., have ever been refuted or even challenged. For the United States, on scale, to be flatter than a pancake necessarily means that the Earth must be flat. The research of Dobson, Campbell, and Fonstadt et al. proves that to be the case. We do not need to rely on the opinions of experts. Simple calculations that can be done by anyone prove that the Earth is not a sphere, but is in fact flat. For example, the continental United States is approximately 2,800 miles across. If the Earth were a globe, the continental United States would have a terrain with a bulged arc approximately 2,613,333 feet, that's 495 miles above sea level across it. No such topographical bulge exists. If the Earth were a globe, the continental United States should have a relief quotient of 0.17, 495 divided by 2,800 equals 0.17. The actual relief quotient of the continental United States, however, does not come close to the relief quotient, 0.17, that would be expected on a spherical Earth. The highest point in the continental United States is 14,494 feet above sea level, and the lowest point is 282 feet below sea level. The relief across the 2,800 mile breadth of the continental United States is therefore 14,776 feet, that's 2.8 miles, 14,494 plus 282 equals 14,776. 14,776 feet equals 2.8 miles. The reason that the 282 feet is added to the 14,494 feet is because the 282 foot elevation is below sea level. Dividing 2.8 miles by the 2,800 mile breadth of the continental United States gives us a relief quotient of 0 0.001. That's 2.8 divided by 2,800 equals 0 0.001. The actual relief quotient for the continental United States of 0 0.001 means that the Earth cannot be a sphere. If the Earth were a sphere, the relief quotient for the continental United States would be exponentially greater, 0.17. Using a pancake as a gauge of flatness, we find that the terrain of the continental United States is, on scale, significantly flatter than a pancake. The relief quotient of a pancake is approximately 0.015 which is much greater than the 0 0.001 relief quotient of the continental United States. That means that the continental United States is flat, which in turn 
means that the Earth is flat. I'm reading from the book, The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe, by Edward Hendry. Chapter 7, Flat Horizon is Always at Eye Level. Not only is the horizon always flat to the observer, but it always rises to eye level with the observer who takes flight no matter how high the observer ascends. If the Earth were a globe, the lateral horizon would be bowed and it would drop below the eye level of the observer as he ascended above the Earth. Eric Dubay explains, whether at sea level, the top of Mount Everest or flying over a hundred thousand feet in the air, the always horizontal horizon line always rises up to meet the eye level of the observer and remains perfectly flat. You can test for yourself on a beach or hilltop, in a large field or desert, aboard a hot air balloon or helicopter. You will see the panoramic horizon ascend with you and remain completely level all around. If the Earth were actually a big ball, however, the horizon would sink as you ascend, not rise to your eye level, and it would dip at each end of your periphery not remain flat all around. Standing in a rising balloon, you would have to look downwards to the horizon. The highest point of the ball earth would be directly beneath you and declining on each side. Jay Glacier wrote in his quote, travels in the air that, quote, on looking over the top of the car, the horizon appeared to be on a level with the eye, and taking a grand view of the whole visible area beneath, I was struck with its great regularity. All was dwarfed to one plane, it seemed too flat. Samuel Robotham illustrates that if the Earth's surface were convex, as it would need to be on a globe, the balloonist, instead of seeing the horizon remain at eye level as the balloon ascends, the horizon would drop down requiring the balloonist to look down to see the horizon. However, that is not what the balloonist sees. The balloonist sees the horizon always at eye level. Robotham illustrates in the image below that, quote, in the case of the balloon at an altitude of two miles, the horizon would have been 127 miles away and more than 10,000 feet below the summit of the arc of water underneath the balloon and over 20,000 feet below the line of sight A, B as shown in the below figure and the dip C, H from C, B to the horizon H would be so great that the aeronaut could not fail to observe it, instead of which he always sees it at a level with his eye, rising as he rises and at the highest elevation seeming to close with the sky. 
Today, any passenger on a commercial airplane can see the very same phenomenon as a balloonist. The horizon of the Earth remains at eye level from the point of the plane's takeoff to its cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. If the Earth were a globe, the horizon would drop below the view of the observer on the airplane. The fact that the passenger sees the horizon always at eye level is proof positive that the Earth is a flat plane. Eric Dubay explains the recent appearance of photographic trickery used in producing curved Earth depictions in NASA and other high-altitude photographs. Amateurs have sent balloons to heights of over 121,000 feet, and you can watch video online of the horizon rising with the camera level and remaining perfectly flat 360 degrees around. NASA videos and other, quote, official sources, however, such as the recent Red Bull skydive at 128,000 feet, have been caught adding fake curvature to the Earth via wide-angle lenses and post-production work. Panoramic photos atop Mount Everest also often claim to be displaying Earth's curvature, but this is simply the result of distortions and limitations inherent in wide-angle lenses. Dubay's allegation of the misleading depictions of a globular Earth by NASA and the controlled media is demonstrated by the two pictures of the Earth below. The picture on the top was taken by NASA Commander Scott Kelly, purportedly while he was aboard the International Space Station, ISS. The space-based ISS almost certainly does not exist. The below picture was likely taken from a high-altitude aircraft. The camera and wide-angle fish-eye lens used by Commander Kelly is depicted in set in the top photo. Commander Kelly himself supplied that picture of the camera. Adobe Photoshop has a feature that allows one to input the kind of camera and type of lens. The software will then automatically adjust the distortion caused by the fisheye lens. A photographic expert did that very thing, and the result is a perfectly flat horizon, as revealed in the bottom picture below. Notice the hot spot caused by the sun, which indicates that the sun is close overhead and much smaller than the Earth. Dubay's allegation that the depictions of a spherical Earth by NASA and the controlled media are misleading can be further verified by watching the Red Bull-sponsored world record skydive of Felix Baumgartner. Before Baumgartner exited his capsule suspended by a balloon at approximately 128,000 feet above the Earth. A camera with an ordinary lens shows the flat, eye-level horizon of the Earth. The picture states, at height of 127,518 feet, because it was taken a few minutes before the jump, the balloon continued to ascend to the jump height of over 128,000 feet. 
if the Earth were a globe, the horizon should not have been visible at eye level at 127,518 feet above the Earth. When Baumgartner steps out of the balloon's capsule and the video is switched to the exterior GoPro camera, suddenly the flat horizon is transformed into a curved horizon. The curved horizon is depicted because the exterior GoPro camera used a wide-angle fisheye lens which caused the Earth's horizon to appear bowed. Below is a picture shortly after Baumgartner jumps from the capsule. Notice the fisheye lens on the GoPro camera shows a concave Earth. The fisheye lens will show the Earth's horizon either concave or convex, depending on the camera's orientation to the horizon. In the picture below, the Earth is at the outer circumference of the fisheye lens, causing the flat horizon to appear concave. In the picture above, however, the sky is at the outer circumference of the fisheye lens, thus causing the Earth's flat horizon to appear convex. In fact, the Earth's horizon is neither convex nor concave. It is flat. Below is a picture taken from a camera aboard a seized German U-2 rocket launched from the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico on October 24, 1946. The photograph was taken from a reported altitude of 65 miles, 343,200 feet. The picture from the upper atmosphere is hailed as the first photograph ever taken of the Earth from what scientists call, quote, space. Today, pilots exceeding 50 miles in altitude are considered to have entered, quote, space, and they are awarded astronaut wings. The World Air Sports Federation, Federation Aeronautique Internationale, has decreed that a pilot exceeding 100 kilometers, 62.1 miles in altitude is considered to have gone into, quote, space. It seems that, quote, space occurs at arbitrary altitudes in nice round numbers. In the U.S., it's 50 miles. In Europe, it's 100 kilometers. That doesn't seem very scientific. The picture taken from an unmanned U-2 rocket was taken almost three times the distance in altitude from which Baumgartner jumped. Notice that the Earth's horizon is perfectly flat. One would think that if the Earth were a globe, the curvature of that globe would be more pronounced the higher in the sky from which the Earth is viewed. Again, this is evidence that the Baumgartner photograph supposedly showing the curvature of the Earth is in fact distorted by the fisheye lens on the GoPro camera used to take the picture. The Earth is, in fact, a flat plane. Below is a screenshot from a video taken from a camera aboard the U-2 launched on October 24, 1946. It shows a little bit longer view of the horizon. The picture published above was cropped 
to show a shorter horizon than is depicted in the video. NASA has cropped the originally published photo of the horizon even further in its version of the U2 high altitude picture posted on its website. NASA displayed the cropped photo behind a circular frame on its website, which provided additional cropping of the horizon. The circular frame was used by NASA, presumably to suggest to the viewer a spherical Earth. The NASA website shows a very limited double cropped view of the photograph that was originally published as the first photograph from space. There seems to be an effort by the government to conceal the flat horizon. One would think that NASA would want to present the most expansive view of the Earth possible. Yet NASA does just the opposite. There is no rational explanation for cropping an already small, grainy photograph of the Earth from the upper atmosphere other than to conceal from the public the flat horizon of the Earth depicted in that photograph. Below is yet another screenshot taken of a video from an altitude of approximately 65 miles, 343,200 feet above the Earth using a camera aboard a separate U-2 rocket launched from the White Sands Missile Range in the late 1940s. It shows yet a longer view of the perfectly flat horizon of the Earth. Below is a frame from a video taken in the 1960s at a reported altitude of 317,000 feet, 60 miles from a camera aboard an X-15 hypersonic experimental aircraft in the 1960s. Note the flat horizon. Below is a picture taken from a camera attached to a balloon floating at approximately 80,000 feet in altitude. Notice the flat eye level horizon. Notice also the hot spot on the clouds cast from the sun. The only way that the sun could cast a hot spot on the clouds would be if the sun was in fact directly over the surface of the earth. It is impossible for a sun that is 93 million miles away as alleged by the heliocentric scientists to cast a hot spot on the clouds. I am reading from the book The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe by Edward Hendry. I'm reading chapter 9 of the third edition of the book entitled No Coriolis Effect Proves a Stationary Earth. One principle of movement on a spinning globe is that the spinning will necessarily produce what is known as a Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect was first postulated by Gustav Gaspard Coriolis, a French engineer, mathematician, and physicist who was born on May 21, 1792 and died on September 19, 1843. The Encyclopedia Britannica states that the Coriolis effect is, quote, 
an effect of motion on a rotating body of paramount importance to meteorology, ballistics, and oceanography. Close quote. The Encyclopedia Britannica further explains the Coriolis effect as it pertains to the supposedly spinning spherical Earth. Quote, In 1835, he, Coriolis, published a paper, quote, on the equations of relative motion of systems of bodies, close quote, in which he showed that on a rotating surface, in addition to the ordinary effects of motion of a body, there is an inertial force acting on the body at right angles to its direction of motion. This force results in a curved path for a body that would otherwise travel in a straight line. The Coriolis force on Earth determines the general wind directions and is responsible for the rotation of hurricanes and tornadoes. Close quote. The Encyclopedia Britannica provided a graphic to explain the Coriolis effect on the supposedly spinning globular Earth. The graphic is reproduced below. The problem with the above illustration from the Encyclopedia Britannica is that it has no basis in fact. The Coriolis force is very real. If the Earth were in fact a spinning globe, the Coriolis effect would be manifested. The problem is that there is no such Coriolis effect taking place on Earth, which means that the Earth is not spinning. The different directions of rotation of hurricanes in northern and southern latitudes has nothing to do with the claimed Coriolis effect of the spinning Earth. Planes that fly north and south do not adjust their flight paths to account for any Coriolis effect. For example, assuming the heliocentric model with the Earth traveling at more than 1,000 miles per hour at the equator, the Coriolis effect would cause a plane flying from Buffalo, New York to Miami, Florida to fly off course in a westerly direction due to the supposed faster spin of the Earth as the plane approaches the wider circumference of the Earth at the latitude of Miami, Florida. Yet, in reality, the flight arrives in Miami on time and without the pilot having to adjust for any Coriolis effect due to the rotation of the Earth. Indeed, if there was a Coriolis effect, it would be nearly impossible to land a plane on a runway. A runway that runs north and south would be careening at approximately 1,000 miles per hour across the path of the plane, which would make it impossible to line up the plane for a landing. The Coriolis effect for spinning objects is real. Modern scientists must sell the myth that there is a Coriolis effect manifested on the Earth in order to make the spinning Earth seem real. The fact that there is no Coriolis effect on the Earth creates a real problem for, quote, scientists. Their solution to that little problem is to lie. They claim that there is a Coriolis effect when there is not. The following from the National Geographic is an example of the modern explanation of the Coriolis effect that is supposed to be manifested on Earth, but is, in fact, completely 
absent. Quote, Let's pretend you're standing at the equator and you want to throw a ball to your friend in the middle of North America. If you throw the ball in a straight line, it will appear to land to the right of your friend because he's moving slower and has not caught up. Now let's pretend you're standing at the North Pole. When you throw the ball to your friend, it will again appear to land to the right of him. But this time, it's because he's moving faster than you are and has moved ahead of the ball. This apparent deflection is the Coriolis effect. Fast-moving objects such as airplanes and rockets are influenced by the Coriolis effect. Pilots must take the Earth's rotation into account when charting flights over long distances. This means most planes are not flown in straight lines, even if the airports are directly across the continent from each other. The line between Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon for instance, is very long and fairly straight. However, a plane flying from Portland, Oregon could not fly in a straight line and land in Portland, Maine. Flying east, the Coriolis effect seems to bend to the right in a southerly direction. If the Oregon pilot flew in a straight line, the plane would end up near New York or Pennsylvania. Military aircraft and missile control technology must calculate the Coriolis effect for similar reasons. The target of an air raid could be missed entirely and innocent people and civilian structures could be damaged. The Coriolis force applies to movement on rotating objects. It is determined by the mass of the object and the object's rate of rotation. The Coriolis force is perpendicular to the object's axis. The Earth spins on its axis from west to east. The Coriolis force, therefore, acts in a north-south direction. The Coriolis force is zero at the equator. Though the Coriolis force is useful in mathematical equations, there is actually no physical force involved. Instead, it is just the ground moving at a different speed than an object in the air." Close quote. The National Geographic is just one of many examples of a massive deception. The Earth is supposed to be spinning at approximately 1,000 miles per hour at the equator. Because the circumference of a ball is smaller north and south of the equator, the Earth does not spin at as great a speed at higher and lower latitudes. Portland, Oregon is at 45 degrees north latitude from the equator, and the purported spin of the Earth at that latitude is approximately 700 miles per hour. Portland, Maine is at 44 degrees north latitude with the spin of the Earth only a tiny bit faster than 700 miles per hour. The Coriolis effect is supposed to put the plane in New York if the pilot simply tried to fly the plane straight and level toward Portland, Maine. That is simply not true. The pilot sets his heading toward Portland, Maine and accounts only for wind conditions. The pilot makes no accommodation whatsoever for a Coriolis effect because the Earth is not spinning. There is no Coriolis effect to calculate. The National Geographic alleges that, quote, military aircraft and missile control technology must calculate the Coriolis effect." Close quote. The National Geographic cites to no authority for its statement for the simple reason that no authority exists. 
no authority exists because it is not true. The National Geographic is simply making things up to fool the gullible public into believing that the Earth is spinning at an incredible speed. The theory of the Coriolis effect in the National Geographic example is that the eastbound plane would be able to keep up with the speed of the allegedly spinning Earth because the plane at takeoff would be adding its speed to the 700 mile per hour speed of the runway in Portland, Oregon. The problem with that argument is that it assumes that the runway is lined up due east and the plane is taking off from the runway in a due east direction. The Coriolis effect is supposed to be based upon the spin of the Earth and the fact that objects in motion over a spinning Earth are moving independent of the spin of the Earth once they are in motion. If there truly were a Coriolis effect on Earth, it would pose a real problem for plane flights. If a plane were to take off from an airport in Portland, Oregon, in a north-south runway, and turned east to fly to Portland, Maine, the plane would never make it to Portland, Maine. That is because the plane would be traveling at approximately 560 miles per hour once it reached cruising altitude. The Earth, however, would be spinning at 700 miles per hour eastbound beneath the plane. The plane would never be able to catch up with the speed of the Earth's spin. The plane would be constantly losing distance over the ground at a rate of 140 miles per hour. Essentially, the plane would be moving backwards over the ground. What is found is exactly the opposite. A plane traveling eastbound from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine would in fact have a shorter flight time than a plane traveling westbound from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon. The reason has nothing to do with the spin of the Earth. The high velocity of eastbound winds at high altitude, known as the jet stream, carry the planes along and allow eastbound flights to have a faster ground speed. The jet stream can have wind speeds ranging from 60 miles per hour to over 250 miles per hour. That same jet stream is a hindrance to westbound flights. It was reported in January 2015 that a British Airways Boeing 777-200 jet was able to travel at ground speeds in excess of 745 miles per hour as it traveled in the eastbound jet stream of approximately 250 miles per hour. Incidentally, the speed of sound is 760 miles per hour at sea level. David Wardlaw Scott explains experiments done in England at the turn of the 20th century using a cannon which showed that there was no Coriolis effect whatsoever manifested on Earth, thus indicating that the Earth is motionless. In the experiments, a cannon was fixed firmly on the ground in a precisely vertical position. The cannon was fired. The cannonball ascended for 14 seconds vertically, and it took 14 seconds for the cannonball to fall back to Earth for a total of 28 seconds aloft. If the Earth were traveling eastward at 600 miles per hour at the latitude in England, 
the cannonball would be expected to land almost five miles to the west of the cannon. However, that did not happen. The cannonball fell generally within two feet of the cannon. In a couple of instances, the cannonball actually returned to the cannon's mouth. If there was any spin to the earth causing a Coriolis effect, it would have been discovered by now. Yet every single experiment ever performed to detect the motion of the earth has resulted a null result. In other words, the Michelson-Morley experiment. Real life experiments have proven that there is no Coriolis effect on Earth because the Earth is stationary. Governmental education systems, however, persist in pushing the myth of a Coriolis effect on a supposedly spinning Earth. Indeed, they must argue that there is a Coriolis effect because if they let it be known that there is no Coriolis effect, that would let the cat out of the bag that the Earth is stationary. For example, below is an illustration from the Coastal Practice Network, which is funded by the European Union Regional Development Fund. Coastal Practice Network showing their depiction of Coriolis effect of a cannon shot on Earth due to the spin of the Earth. However, no such effect actually happens because the Earth is not a globe and does not spin. Indeed, if there were truly a Coriolis effect on Earth as depicted in the above illustration, then the artillery officers and snipers would be trained to consider the spin of the Earth in making their calculations for accurate firing. Yet, you will look in vain for any mention of Coriolis effect in any military artillery or sniper instruction manual. In all of the wars fought throughout history, no soldier has ever been instructed to consider the Coriolis effect of a spinning earth when sighting in a target with his artillery piece or other weapon. The folly of adjusting for a mythical Coriolis effect would be immediately apparent as the soldier's round would travel off course and miss the target. This author is a former federal firearms instructor. I have seen many thousands of rounds shot from all kinds of firearms at various distances. I have never witnessed any round fired ever be affected by the alleged Coriolis effect. I have never read the Coriolis effect discussed in any firearms manual, nor have I ever heard it to be discussed by any firearms instructor as something to consider in the use of any firearm from any distance. If in the real world, those whose lives depend on the accuracy of their performance using weapons do not consider the Coriolis effect. That is convincing evidence that there is no Coriolis effect on Earth. That means that the Earth is not spinning. All of the pretty colored diagrams showing a spinning Earth with cannonballs going off course due to the supposed Coriolis effect 
depict an unreal myth. The earth is fixed and does not move. I'm reading from the book, The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe, by Edward Hendry. Chapter 10, Simple Proof That Heliocentrism Is Impossible. For most people, it is a new concept to have the sun within the plane of the earth and much smaller than the Earth. Before discussing the scientific proof for that, let us examine the standard theory of the heliocentric model. Under the heliocentric theory, the Earth orbits the Sun once every 365.25 days. Since we only have a 365-day calendar, every four years, 4 times 0.25 equals 1 day, we have a leap year and add a 29th day to February to make up that one missing day. In those 365.25 days, the Earth is supposed to orbit a full 360 degrees around the Sun. At the same time the Earth is orbiting the Sun, it is completing one 360-degree rotation every 24 hours. Under the heliocentric model, as the Earth travels around the Sun, each day the Earth will be a little less than one degree further in its orbit from the previous day. That means that every six months the Earth will be 180 degrees in its orbit around the Sun and be opposite the Sun from where it was six months earlier. There is a problem with this model. Let us assume that we begin our observation of the Sun at 12 noon in New York on September 22nd. Each solar day is precisely 24 hours in length. According to the heliocentric model, every 24-hour day, the Earth is supposed to do an exact 360-degree spin on its axis and end up at the same place. At the same time, each day the Earth has traveled a little less than one degree of the 360-degree orbit around the Sun. That means that after six months, 12 noon in New York will arrive during the middle of the dark night on March 21st. To recap, 12 noon arrives in the middle of the day in New York on our start day on September 22nd. The heliocentric theory requires the Earth to be at the opposite side of the Sun six months later. Consequently, New York will be on the dark side of the Earth facing away from the Sun at 12 noon on March 21st. In New York, therefore, on March 21st, 12 noon should arrive during the middle of the night. Under the heliocentric model, this occurrence should happen year in and year out, every year. We know, however, that does not happen, which means that the heliocentric model is wrong. According to our 365-day calendar, we need a leap year once every four years to make up for a missing day. That means that after six months, the Earth is supposed to have missed one-eighth day of its orbit around the Sun. However, that does not change the fact that under the heliocentric model, 
12 noon in New York will progressively move a little less than one degree each day until it arrives during the middle of the dark night opposite the sun after six months. That is because each solar day is precisely 24 hours in length, which under the heliocentric model requires the Earth to rotate exactly 360 degrees on its axis in those 24 hours. The high priests of heliocentricity have perceived the problem with their model and adjusted it to accommodate its error. What did they do? They added 0.986 degrees to the 360 degree rotation of the Earth to come up with the Earth spinning 360.986 degrees each day. Where did they get the 0.986 degrees? They simply made it up by dividing the 360 degree of orbit by 365.25 days in the year to come up with 0.986 degrees. With this little mathematical adjustment, their problem is seemingly solved because they claim the Earth rotates 360.986 degrees in 24 hours, they calculated that the period of time for the Earth to rotate 360 degrees is 23 hours, 56 minutes, 4.1 seconds. They call this shorter day a sidereal day. A sidereal day is supposed to be based upon the length of time which passes between the position of the stars in the night sky. A sidereal day is irrelevant to the movement of the sun. Below is a diagram from Cornell University Department of Astronomy illustrating the contrived 360.986 degree rotation each day. The first problem with the 360.986 degree solution is that it is contrary to the orthodoxy of the heliocentric model which presents a precise 360 degree rotation of the Earth each 24 hour solar day. The reason that the standard heliocentric model requires a 360 degree rotation in 24 hours is that it comports with the actual movement of the Sun over the Earth. The 360 degree path of the Sun over the Earth every 24 hours is observable and measurable. The Annenberg Foundation's Teacher Resource Center, which is affiliated with Colorado State University, has a model of the globular spinning Earth and explains that, quote, each day the Earth rotates once on its axis, which equals 360 degrees, close quote. The University of California at Berkeley's online self-study guide states that the Earth spins 360 degrees every 24 hours. Quote, full turn equals 360 degrees, close quote. The University of Chicago Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics states that the Earth rotates 360 degrees, quote, once every 24 hours, close quote. Professor of Astronomy Courtney Seligman, who has taught college astronomy for 39 years, states that, quote, to calculate how long it takes for the Earth to rotate through an angle of one degree, we divide the length of the day, 24 hours, or 1,440 minutes, by the 360 degrees it turns through 
during that rotation, obtaining a rotational speed of four minutes per degree." Close quote. Professor Seligman created a diagram of the movement of the Earth around the Sun. He gave the following explanation of the diagram. Quote, In the diagram below, the four blue dots on the right represent the position of the planet at four times, separated from each other by a third of a rotation period. The number of rotations that the planet has made is indicated by the numbers to the right of each dot. The white dot shows how the position of a specific place on the planet changes as the planet rotates to the east counterclockwise in this diagram, and the large yellow dot on the far left represents the position of the Sun. The sizes of the Sun and planet, and the angle that the planet moves through during one rotation have been exaggerated to make it easier to see what is happening. The movement of a planet during one rotation the planet's movement around the sun causes the sun to appear to move around the sky. Each degree that the planet moves around the sun causes the sun to appear to move a degree around the planet. Professor Seligman illustrates the standard model of heliocentricity with the movement of the earth around the sun as it rotates on its axis 360 degrees each 24-hour day. His diagram confirms this author's diagram presented at the beginning of the chapter as the standard heliocentric construct. The depiction of the heliocentric orbit of the Earth at the beginning of this chapter was from Penn State University, John A. Dutton, E Education Institute, and it is the standard heliocentric model accepted by virtually all scientists today. The diagram was annotated by this author with the captions pointing out where 12 noon in New York would be at each quarter of the Earth's yearly orbit. Other than the annotations, the diagram appears as Penn State depicted it. Professor Seligman has taught college astronomy for 39 years and has a full and complete understanding of heliocentrism. His diagram illustrates that the heliocentric model does not comport with reality. If Professor Seligman's diagram was expanded to encompass a 180-degree travel of the Earth around the Sun, we would find that 12 noon would arrive in the middle of the night after six months' time, just as depicted in the diagram at the beginning of this chapter. We know that, in fact, every day, 12 noon arrives in the middle of the day in New York. There has never been a day in the history of New York ever when 12 noon was in the dark of the night. That simple fact proves that the heliocentric model is wrong. Professor Seligman and the many astronomers like him are wrong that the Earth orbits the Sun. They are correct, however, about the relationship between the Sun and the Earth being one of 360 degrees and 24 hours. The Sun, in fact, does make a 360-degree circuit over the flat Earth once every 24 hours. The contrivance of other astronomers of the Earth spinning 360.986 degrees every 24 hours is provably wrong. 
It is refuted by the fact that the sun can be measured to move in a 360 degree path over the earth every 24 hours. All celestial navigation is based upon that truth. Celestial navigation is based upon the confirmable fact that the sun moves 15 degrees each hour, 360 degrees divided by 24 hours equals 15 degrees. Each hour can in turn be broken down to minutes per degrees by simply taking 60 minutes divided by 15 degrees equals 4 minutes per degree. James I. Sammons explains the basic concepts of celestial navigation. As with most people, he has been conditioned to believe that it is a rotating earth that causes the movement of the sun in its path. However, he is absolutely correct about the sun and the earth having a relationship of 360 degrees in 24 hours. Indeed, that is the basic starting point for all celestial navigation. Quote, Just as we saw in finding latitude, finding longitude is easy enough when we've learned three basic ideas. The first of these ideas is the relationship between time and the rotation of the Earth. It takes an average time of 24 hours for the Earth to rotate 360 degrees so that a spot on its surface will move from under the sun and then just return to its under the sun starting position. In 12 hours, the Earth will turn half around. In six hours, a quarter. If you divide the number of degrees in a circle by the number of hours in a day, we find that the Earth turns 15 degrees each hour. 360 degrees divided by 24 hours equals 15 degrees per hour. We can take this a step further and state that the Earth turns one degree in four minutes. One hour equals 60 minutes divided by 15 degrees equals four minutes per degree. Mariners have been using celestial navigation for hundreds of years to mark an accurate course. It is based upon the 360 degree movement of the sun over the earth in 24 hours. Of course, modern mariners have been conditioned to believe that it is the globular earth that is spinning. Mariners, however, have often found that their charts based upon a globular earth were inaccurate, particularly in the southern latitudes, when they compared their dead reckoning using their charts with their more accurate celestial navigation. The fact that celestial navigation is based upon the sun's movement of 360 degrees in 24 hours and that it actually works impeaches the sidereal day construct that postulates a 360.986 degree spin of the earth in 24 hours. Sidereal literally means, quote, relating to or expressed in relationship to stars or other constellations, close quote. A sidereal day is a measure of the movement of the stars. It is pure and simple deception to apply calculations for the movement of the stars to the movement of the sun. Never has there been celestial navigation involving the sun traveling 360.986 degrees in 24 hours. That proves that the added 0.986 degrees is wrong. It is a contrivance of the heliocentric priesthood. It is a superstitious belief that was conjured up 
in order to explain the otherwise impossible heliocentric model. The added 0.986 degrees only has validity because the scientists say so. Their 360.986 degrees contrivance is impeached by the observable reality that the sun travels a precise 360 degree circuit over the earth once every 24 hours. That verifiable fact means that the heliocentric model would require high noon to move each day and ultimately arrive at midnight once every six months. The fact that such an occurrence does not happen proves the heliocentric model is a lie. Max Planck was one of the most noted scientists of the last century. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1918. He revealed the cult-like belief system in the scientific community. He stated that, quote, Anybody who has been seriously engaged in scientific work of any kind realizes that over the entrance to the gates of the Temple of Science are written the words, Ye must have faith. It is a quality which the scientist cannot dispense with. Close quote. So called, quote, scientists close quote, today are more akin to witch doctors who have mesmerized the superstitious tribe to believe their booga, booga, nonsense. Chapter 11 from The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe by Edward Hendry. Chapter title, The Testimony of the Stars. Polaris proves that the heliocentric model is pure fantasy. Polaris, the North Star, is fixed above the North Pole of the Earth. The North Star does not move. It has never moved from its fixed position over the North Pole from the fourth day of creation, Genesis chapter 1 verse 16, until today. The North Star is alleged by modern scientists to be 433.8 light years away from the Earth. That means that a person would have to travel at the speed of light for 433.8 years before reaching the North Star. Light travels at approximately 186,282 miles per second, which is over 670 million miles per hour. If the North Star is above the North Pole, it must be moving in precise and exact synchronization with the Earth. The Earth is supposed to be traveling at 67,000 62 miles per hour around the sun in a slightly elliptical path with an average radius of over 92 million miles, approximately 1.8 billion miles in circumference. What makes the heliocentric model even more impossible is that while the North Star is supposed to be keeping itself in perfect synchronization with the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, the Sun itself is supposed to be traveling at a speed of approximately 500,000 miles per hour around the Milky Way galaxy. Adding to the impossibility, the Milky Way galaxy is hypothesized by modern scientists to be racing through space at a speed ranging from 300,000 to 1,340,000 miles per hour. The heliocentric fairy tale gets even more fantastic. 
the perfect synchronization of the North Star with the Earth finds its origin in a massive chaotic explosion called the Big Bang that happened billions of years ago. This insane fantasy masquerading as science of a spherical spinning and orbiting Earth is so ingrained in the consciousness of the world that any refutation of it is viewed by the world as itself evidence of ignorance and perhaps even insanity. Believing in a flat earth is immediately met with derision. The person is viewed as being an ignorant savage or part of a crazy fringe cult. President Barack Obama recently tapped into that conditioned response and used it against those who were impeding his plans for reducing the American standard of living by reducing our consumption of so-called fossil fuels. Obama stated in a speech that anyone who denied that global warming is real is an ignorant person who believes in a flat earth. President Obama angrily blasted climate change skeptics during his energy policy speech Tuesday at Georgetown University, saying he lacked patience for anyone who denies that this problem is real. Quote, we don't have time for a meeting of the Flat Earth Society. How did scientists come up with the fantastic distance that the North Star is from the Earth? Simple. They made it up. There is no evidence to support that distance. Indeed, all of the fantastic distances in the heliocentric model were simply hypothesized to explain why all the stars move in unison without any parallax. Parallax is the movement of one star in relation to another star that would be expected to be seen if the Earth were spinning and orbiting in space around the Sun. What is observed, however, is no parallax between the stars whatsoever. With the exception of a few wandering stars, which today are called the planets of the alleged solar system, the stars move in unison as though they are part of one great single mass. That proved to be a problem for the heliocentric model. Indeed, such movement makes the heliocentric model impossible. In order to explain away the lack of parallax, the priests of heliocentrism simply expanded the universe in their minds and scientific papers and argued since the stars are so far away that the parallax is imperceptible to us on Earth. The problem with that argument is that no matter how far away the stars are, parallax would be discernible if the Earth were moving. There is no parallax because the stars are in fact within the firmament. Genesis chapter 1 verses 14 through 18, moving in perfect unison over a flat, stationary Earth. I'm reading from the book, The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe, by Edward Hendry. This is chapter 16 of the third edition, NASA and Freemasonry. Thomas Africa reveals that Nicholas Copernicus, 1473 through 1543, A.D. was not a revolutionary discoverer of a new heliocentric astronomy. He was rather a restorer of the heliocentric type of system espoused by Pythagoras of Samos, 570 through 495 B.C. Some state 
that Pythagoras' system was not purely heliocentric, but that it was a system where the planets, including the sun, orbited a central, invisible fire. Nevertheless, Pythagoras' system was the first system that called for the planets to travel in a circular orbit, and so he has been recognized by the early scientists as the true founder of the heliocentric system. In fact, Johann Kepler, 1571 through 1630 AD, called Pythagoras the, quote, grandfather of all Copernicans, close quote. Copernicus himself insisted that his system was not an innovation, but was rather a revival of the lost doctrine of Pythagoras. Galileo Galilei, 1564 through 1642 AD, viewed the papal edict of 1616 as a suppression of the, quote, Pythagorean opinion of the mobility of the earth, close quote. Copernicus also, quote, borrowed from the theories of Aristarchus of Samos, 310 through 230 BC, that the earth orbited the sun. Copernicus had no problem acknowledging the contributions of Pythagoras, but for some reason he decided to conceal his knowledge of Aristarchus' writings. Thomas Africa reveals that, quote, Copernicus knew of Aristarchus' heliocentrism, but consistently concealed this knowledge and finally deleted his one passing reference to it, either from vanity, Pythagorean scruples, or both." Close quote. Pythagoras was the first person to have presented the idea of the circular orbit of spherical planets around a central fire. He is purported to have added a counter-Earth to arrive at 10 orbiting planets, including the Sun. Jose Budka alleges that the added counter-Earth was to explain eclipses and because the number 10 was viewed as sacred by heathen philosophers. Not coincidentally, the ten orbiting spheres match the ten spherical sephirot of the Jewish Kabbalistic god Ein Sof. Master Mason, Dr. James Anderson, founder of the London Masonic Lodge, stated in his book, Defense of Masonry, that Freemasonry descended from Pythagoras. Master Mason William Hutchinson stated in his book, Spirit of Masonry, that ancient Masonic records indicate that the foundation of Freemasonry is in Pythagorean principles. Another Master Mason, William Preston, in his Illustrations of Masonry, states that Pythagoras was initiated into the deep, mysterious Masonic principles, which he then spread to the countries in which he traveled. Albert Mackey, in the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, reveals the following details about Pythagoras and his Masonic connections. Quote, in his return to Europe, he, Pythagoras, established his celebrated school at Crotona, 
a Dorian colony in the south of Italy about 529 BC, much resembling that subsequently adopted by the Freemasons. Before admission to the privileges of this school, the previous life and character of the candidate were rigidly scrutinized, and in the preparatory initiation, secrecy was enjoined by an oath, and he was made to submit to the severest trials of his fortitude and self-command. The mode of living in the school of Cretona was like that of the modern communists." Close quote. The Jewish Encyclopedia labels some of the Kabbalistic philosophies as Pythagorean. Both the Pythagorean occultism and the Kabbalah flowed from Babylonian mysticism. The Jewish Encyclopedia asserts that Gnosticism was Jewish in character and is of Chaldean, that is to say, Babylonian origin. That indicates that the Gnosticism finds its origins from Jews in Babylon. The Kabbalah is the written memorialization of the mysticism that was adopted by the Jews during their Babylonian captivity. The word Pythagorean is an adjective and seems to be used in the Jewish encyclopedia to identify the kind of doctrines in the Kabbalah. They are of the same nature as Pythagorean doctrines. It certainly cannot mean that the Kabbalah flowed from Pythagoras because the Jews were first brought into captivity in Babylon on or about 597 BC, which was approximately 27 years before Pythagoras was born. The Jews were released from their Babylonian captivity on or about 538 BC. Pythagoras was a Greek. He did not travel to Babylon until on or about 525 BC. Pythagoras was reportedly held captive there for five years. Amblichus, born on or about 250 AD, who was a Syrian philosopher, writes that Pythagoras, quote, was transported by the followers of Cambyses as a prisoner of war. Whilst he was there, he gladly associated with the Magoi and was instructed in their sacred rites and learnt about a very mystical worship of the gods. He also reached the acme of perfection in arithmetic and music and the other mathematical sciences taught by the Babylonians." Close quote. Pythagoras could not have been the source of any of the doctrines in the Kabbalah, because by the time Pythagoras came on the scene, the Jews had already been held captive in Babylon, been introduced to the Babylonian occult mysteries, and been released from their captivity. No doubt, there were many Jewish mystics still in Babylon by the time that Pythagoras arrived. It is likely that at that time, Pythagoras was initiated into the mysteries of what we know today as the Kabbalah. The Jewish Encyclopedia, by calling some of the Kabbalistic philosophies Pythagorean, seems to be more an homage to Pythagoras that it's used to describe the nature of particular doctrines found in the Kabbalah. Indeed, when called upon to identify the source of the mysticism in the Kabbalah, the Jewish encyclopedia stated unequivocally 
that Gnosticism is of Jewish character and is of, quote, Chaldean, that is to say, Babylonian origin, close quote. Certainly, there could have been some synergism in the interactions between the Kabbalistic Jews and Pythagoras, but that does not erase the truth that in the end, the philosophies of both the Jewish mystics and Pythagoras are rooted in occult Babylonianism. The fact that the Pythagorean theorem for which Pythagoras is famous was known by the Babylonians a thousand years before Pythagoras testifies to the Babylonian origins of his philosophy. S. Pankost, who was a physician to the infamous occult theosophist H. P. Blavatsky, states that Pythagoras was a Kabbalist of the highest order. He further states that the symbols of masonry are Kabbalistic and were known to Pythagoras. Pankos reveals that Pythagoras' initiation into the secrets of the Kabbalah led Pythagoras to the heliocentric philosophy. Quote, Pythagoras held that the sun is the center of the solar system around which all the planets revolve, that the stars are suns like ours, each the center of a system, that the earth revolves yearly around the sun and daily on its axis, that the planets are inhabited and that they and the earth are ever revolving in regular order. Johann Ruchlin, 1455 through 1522, was a German humanist and a political counselor to the Chancellor of Germany. He was a classic scholar and an expert in the ancient languages and traditions, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Ruchlin was affiliated with the heads of the Platonic Academia, Della Mirandola, and others. Ruchlin confirmed that Pythagoras obtained his philosophy through the Jewish Kabbalah. Quote, Pythagoras, who is the father of philosophy, did nevertheless not receive those teachings from the Greeks, but rather he received them from the Jews. Therefore, he must be called a Kabbalist, and he himself was the first to convert the name Kabbalah, unknown to the Greeks, in the Greek name philosophy. Pythagoras' philosophy emanated from the infinite sea of the Kabbalah." Close quote. Freemasonry can be traced to Pythagoras and is a religion that is founded upon the Jewish Kabbalah. Albert Pike states in Morals and Dogma that, quote, Masonry is a search for light that leads us directly back, as you see, to the Kabbalah." Close quote. Albert Mackey, in his authoritative Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, confirms Albert Pike's averment. Mackey states that the Kabbalah being, quote, the mystical philosophy or theosophy of the Jews is intimately connected with the symbolic science of Freemasonry." Close quote. Upon what authority did Albert Pike rely for writing his authoritative Morals and Dogma of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite? Martin L. Wagner conducted an objective and thorough study of Freemasonry and wrote a book about his findings titled Freemasonry in Interpretation. Wagner states that, quote, 
Albert Pike drew largely from the writings of Eliphas Levi, the Abi Constant, a great Kabbalist, and whom Buck considers as knowing more of the occult science than anyone since the days of the old initiates for illuminating and illustrating Freemasonry. Close quote. The Kabbalah is unadulterated witchcraft. Magic and occult mysticism run throughout the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah contains a great deal of black magic and sorcery and invoking the powers of devils. One of the key points revealed in the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion is the secret use of ostensibly Gentile nations and institutions in order to further Jewish Zionist aims while hiding the Jewish influence over those institutions. In the Protocols, the learned elders of Zion state that they have used masonry as a cover to hide their involvement in the plan for a, quote, new world order, close quote. Paragraph 2 of Protocol 4 states, Who and what is in a position to overthrow an invisible force? And this is precisely what our force is. Gentile masonry blindly serves as a screen for us in our objectives. But the plan of action of our force, even its very abiding place, remains for the whole people in unknown mystery." Close quote. The Gentile facade of Freemasonry offers the Zionist Jews the perfect cover. We can see the same hidden control by Jews over the, quote, Christian Zionist movement. Freemasonry is based upon Judaism. It is a Gentile front for Jewish mysticism whose history, grades, and official appointments are rooted in Jewish theosophy. The Zionists promote and control Masonic lodges. They use those lodges as indispensable secret intelligence agencies and organs of influence. Paragraphs 4 and 5 of Protocol 15 states, We shall create and multiply free Masonic lodges in all the countries of the world, absorb into them all who may become or who are prominent in public activity. For these lodges, we shall find our principal intelligence office and means of influence. All these lodges we shall bring under one central administration, known to us alone and to all others absolutely unknown, which will be composed of our learned elders. It is natural that we and no other should lead Masonic activities, for we know whither we are leading. We know the final goal of every form of activity, whereas the Goyim have knowledge of nothing. Zionist Jews use the lodges of Freemasonry as recruiting grounds for their Gentile frontmen. The Gentile nature of Freemasonry is only a cover. Freemasonry is wholly based upon the Jewish Kabbalah. Using the Gentile front of Freemasonry to further Zionist ends is explained in paragraphs 4 and 7 of Protocol 11. The Goyim are a flock of sheep, and we are their wolves. And you know what happens 
when the wolves get hold of the flock? For what purpose, then, have we invented this whole policy and insinuated it into the minds of the goy without giving them any chance to examine its underlying meaning? For what, indeed, if not in order to obtain in a roundabout way what is for our scattered tribe unattainable by the direct road? It is this which has served as the basis for our organization of secret masonry, which is not known to, and aims which are not even so much as suspected by, these, quote, goy, cattle, attracted by us into the, quote, show, army of Masonic lodges, in order to throw dust into the eyes of their fellows. The statements in the protocols that Freemasonry is rooted in Judaism is confirmed by Wagner in his study of Freemasonry. Wagner quotes Masonic authorities that reveal that, quote, Masonry, in its purity, derived as it is from the old Hebrew Kabbalah, as a part of the great universal wisdom religion of remotest antiquity." Close quote. Wagner concludes, quote, A candid investigation convinces us that Freemasonry is indebted in a very large measure to the Kabbalah for its philosophical ideas, its methods of interpreting the scriptures, its doctrines of emanations, its art speech, its cosmogonical views, and its veils and glyphs. In a certain sense, it is a continuation of the Kabbalah under a different name and guise." Close quote. Further confirmation of the Judaic foundations of Freemasonry comes from the authoritative Rabbi Isaac Wise. Wise confirms that the Gentile nature of Freemasonry is only a cover. Quote, Freemasonry is a Jewish establishment whose history, grades, official appointments, passwords, and explanations are Jewish from beginning to end. Close quote. The October 28, 1927 Jewish Tribune of New York stated, quote, Masonry is based on Judaism. Eliminate the teachings of Judaism from the Masonic ritual and what is left. Close quote. Michael Hoffman concluded, quote, It is from these Kabbalistic and Talmudic recondite doctrines of Judaism that the Freemasons and other occult workers of iniquity derive their beliefs. Close quote. Henry Makow describes Freemasonry as quote, Judaism for Gentiles. Close quote. Makow states that it is quote, a way for the Kabbalistic Jewish elite to enlist Gentiles in their conspiracy." Close quote. What are the religious doctrines flowing from the Kabbalah that form the foundation of Freemasonry? It is the worship of Lucifer. Albert Pike, the theological pontiff of Freemasonry explains, quote, that which we must say to a crowd is, we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. To you, sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. 
the Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degrees, maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Adonai, whose deeds prove his cruelty, perfidy, and hatred of man, barbarism, and repulsion for science, would Adonai and his priests calumniate him? Yes. Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary to the statue and the break to the locomotive. Thus, the doctrine of Satanism is heresy, and the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai. But Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the god of darkness and evil." Close quote. Adonai is the Hebrew word used in the Old Testament that is the name for God and is translated into English in the Bible as, quote, Lord. Pike blasphemously calls God, quote, the God of darkness and evil." Close quote. Pike calls Lucifer the quote, God of good. Close quote. Pike admits that Lucifer is the Masonic God of light. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11.14 In his authoritative treatise, that is, to this day, the doctrinal Bible of Masonry, Morals and Dogma, Pike pays homage to the God of Freemasonry. Quote, Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness, Lucifer, the son of the morning, it is he who bears the light, and with its splendors intolerable, blinds feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not." Close quote. Lucifer's name, in fact, means, quote, light bearer, close quote. The Masonic initiation ceremonies finds the candidate repeatedly seeking more light. If the candidate reaches the highest degree of Freemasonry, he will be informed that the light he seeks is found in the light bearer, Lucifer, who is the god of Freemasonry. Manley P. Hall, 33rd degree Freemason, and highly respected Masonic authority explains that, quote, when the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy." Close quote. Heliocentrism is a fundamental tenet of the Kabbalah. Consequently, heliocentrism is central to Freemasonry. Many Masonic lodges throughout the world are named in honor of Copernicus. 
The following praise of Copernicus is from the 1843 Freemasons Quarterly Review. Quote, Copernicus and his successors in the study of the starry firmament have supplanted the art of astrology by proving that all the movements of the heavenly bodies tend to promote the honor and glory of the great architect of the universe. The link between heliocentrism and Freemasonry explains the close affiliation between Freemasonry and NASA. For example, James Edwin Webb, who was the NASA Administrator from 1961 through 1968, was a Freemason. In the November 1969 edition of the Masonic magazine, The New Age, there appeared an article written by 33rd degree Freemason Kenneth S. Kleinneck, who was the manager of the Apollo Program Command and Service Modules, the deputy manager of the Gemini Program, and the manager of Project Mercury. Kenneth S. Kleinneck, by the way, is the brother of C. Fred Kleinneck. 33rd degree Sovereign Grand Commander, the Supreme Consul, Mother Consul of the World, Southern Jurisdiction, USA, Washington. In the New Age article, Kenneth Kleinneck stated, quote, Note how many of the astronauts themselves are Brother Masons. Edwin E. Aldrin, Jr., L. Gordon Cooper, Jr., Don F. Isle, Walter M. Shira, Thomas P. Stafford, Edgar D. Mitchell, and Paul J. White. Before his tragic death in a flash fire at Cape Kennedy on January 27, 1967, Virgil I. Gus Grissom was a Mason too. Astronaut Gordon Cooper, during his epical Gemini 5 spaceflight in August of 1965, carried with him the official 33rd degree jewel and a Scottish Rite flag. Via the lunar plaque, the Masonic insignia and flag, and the Masonic astronauts themselves. Masonry already is in the space age. Can we doubt Freemasonry and its spiritual relevance to the modern era when even its material representatives have today made historic inroads into the infinite expanses of outer space? Close quote. The Grand Lodge of Texas, AF and AM, has posted the following explanation on the internet regarding its chartering of a Masonic Lodge on the Moon, which is titled Tranquility Lodge No. 2000. Quote, on July 20, 1969, two American astronauts landed on the moon of the planet Earth in an area known as Sea of Tranquility. One of those brave men was Brother Edwin Eugene Buzz Aldrin Jr., a member of Clear Lake Lodge number 1417, AF and AM, Seabrook, Texas. Brother Aldrin carried with him special deputation of then Grandmaster J. Guy Smith, constituting and appointing Brother Aldrin as Special Deputy of the Grand Master, granting unto him full power in the premises to represent the Grand Master as such, and authorize him to claim Masonic territorial jurisdiction for the most worshipful Grand Lodge of Texas ancient and free, and accepted Masons 
on the moon and directed that he make due return of his acts. Brother Aldrin certified that the special deputation was carried by him to the moon on July 20, 1969. Freemason Buzz Aldrin with Luther A. Smith, the Masonic Sovereign Grand Commander, holding the Masonic flag Aldrin took with him when he allegedly landed on the moon. Buzz Aldrin was interviewed by Alex Jones in 2009. During the interview, there was the following exchange between Alex Jones and Buzz Aldrin. Mr. Aldrin, I always wanted to ask you this. We saw the photos of the little Masonic flag to the moon and some of the names of the missions and the numerology. Uh, is there anything to that, or what is the Masonic influence? We know there's a Masonic influence in the founding of the country. Uh, what is the Masonic influence on NASA? As far as I can tell, zero. Uh, there were some Masonic brothers of mine in Texas that wanted me to take some kind of a Masonic emblem to the moon in some gesture of... Uh, I don't know what it would be a gesture of, but I uh, told them that uh, it it was not within my uh, my authority to to do such a thing. Absolutely. Aldrin is on record with a September 19, 1969 letter he sent three days after meeting with the heads of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., acknowledging that he presented the very flag he denied carrying to the moon during the 2009 Alex Jones interview. Furthermore, there was an article in the December 1969 issue of the Masonic magazine, New Age, the official organ of the Scottish Rite Southern Jurisdiction, which included a picture of Aldrin presenting to the Scottish Rite headquarters in Washington the, quote, Masonic emblem, which he allegedly carried with him to the moon and back. Why would Aldrin lie about the Masonic connection to NASA? Because it would reveal the real power and influence behind NASA. Pulling on that thread would expose the hidden agenda. Didn't Aldrin know that he was on record as claiming that he carried a Masonic flag to the moon in the September 19, 1969 letter sent to the heads of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry? He certainly knew of the letter and that the Masonic Brotherhood knew of his claimed possession of a Masonic flag on the moon. So many communications, however, within Masonry are secret and sealed by blood oath that he probably was confused as to which of the many communications he has had within Masonry were public. His life is so compartmentalized between his public facade, which is mostly based upon deception, and his private Masonic communications, which are for the most part secret, that he simply could not keep the secret Masonic communications from the few public Masonic communications straight in his mind. Without much time to reflect on his answer, to the unexpected question from Alex Jones, Aldrin simply resorted to his standard operating procedure. He lied. You're the one who said you walked on the moon when you didn't. Calling the kettle black if I ever thought of it. Saying Will I misrepresented myself. Get away from me. You're a coward and a liar and a thief.
There has been, and probably continues to be, a controlling faction making up a statistically unlikely plurality of Masonic astronauts and administrators at NASA. In fact, Kleinex's list of Masonic astronauts in his New Age article is by no means complete. For example, John Glenn Jr., Mercury 6, James Irwin, Apollo 15, and Fred Hayes, Apollo 13, all of whom were Freemasons, are missing from Kleinex honor roll of astronaut Freemasons. Freemasons are very proud of their NASA connection. Aldrin's denial of any Masonic connection to NASA suggests that knowledge of the connection is to be kept within the Masonic Brotherhood. Below is a Masonic medallion struck in commemoration of the 10th anniversary of the Apollo 11 alleged moon landings. The following description of the medallion appears on the Phoenix Freemason Museum website. Quote, this 1979 medallion was struck to commemorate the 10th anniversary of our flags on the moon. Many people were never aware that astronaut and brother Neil Armstrong carried aboard on his Apollo flight to the moon two flags. One was the American flag, the other was a flag designed by the Southern Jurisdiction of the Scottish Rite, depicting the double-headed eagle emblem. This flag now resides in the museum collection of the Scottish Rite Museum at the House of the Temple. It is a spectacular three-dimensional medallion that measures one and three-quarter inches in diameter. It was made by the Medallic Art Company of Dansbury, Connecticut." Close quote. Richard Hoagland, who was a former science advisor to CBS News during the Apollo program from 1968 through 1971, alleges in his book, Dark Mission, The Secret History of NASA, that NASA is controlled by Freemasons, and from NASA's beginnings, it has had an occult underside that has been carefully concealed from the public. While Hoagland's statement is true, Bill Casing has good reason to believe that Hoagland is a shill working for NASA who is trying to divert attention away from the fact that NASA never went to the moon. From 1956 to 1963, Casing was the head of technical publications for the entire propulsion laboratory at Rocketdyne, which was a research facility for the development of large liquid propellant rocket engines. Rocketdyne was a division of North American Aviation and later of Rockwell International, which built the Saturn V rockets used in the NASA Apollo missions. While at Rocketdyne, Casing had top secret clearance which gave him access to documents pertaining to the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. Casing became convinced by what he saw at Rocketdyne and subsequent research that the Apollo moon landings were a complete hoax. He set forth his evidence in a book first published in 1976 titled, We Never Went to the Moon, America's $30 billion Swindle. There seems to be merit to Casing's allegation about Hoagland. 
Hoagland has made an effort to spin the evidence of the clearly faked NASA photos and videos, not as proof that the moon landings never took place, but rather as proof that NASA is concealing the existence of space aliens. In the intelligence community, that is called a limited hangout, where part of a conspiracy is seemingly exposed by a shill in order to spin the people in a direction away from the truth and provide some plausible but less nefarious explanation for the government deception. Hoagland avers that only some of the moon photos and videos are fake. He advocates a position that NASA went to the moon and NASA doctored only some of the photographs to hide evidence of intelligent life. In a radio interview, Hoagland stated, quote, I'll give you my bottom line. I think that there is an enormous Apollo conspiracy, but I think we've been sold the wrong conspiracy to keep people like you, bright guys who are asking good questions, looking in the wrong direction, which these people are taskmasters at doing. The real conspiracy is not, did we go to the moon? but what did we find on the moon that they don't want you to know? I have found areas where NASA faked the imagery, I believe, to hide really cool stuff." Close quote. Hoagland uses hyperbole and inaccurate information. One way the intelligence community discredits opposition to its programs is to expose inaccuracies that have been sown by its own shills. Care should be taken to verify the facts. That is why this author has provided endnotes establishing the authority for virtually every fact in this book. Hoagland presents some evidence that is true. The occult Masonic influence in NASA and the fake photos and videos, but then spins their significance away from the hoaxed moon landings and toward space aliens. That serves to discredit the information about the occult practices and the fake photos, and thus causes many people to dismiss any thought that the moon landings were fake. For other people, Hoagland's theory of NASA fabricating videos and photos in order to conceal life on other planets gives some plausible, less nefarious explanation for the NASA deception and serves to steer those people away from the fact that NASA did not go to the moon. The purpose for NASA's existence is to conceal the flat earth in order to condition people to believe the satanic lie of a spinning, orbiting earth where man is an insignificant part of an infinite, godless universe. Hoagland furthers that end. Those who have exposed the fraud of NASA seem to give little thought to motive behind faking the moon landings. 
Some ascribe the motive to distraction from the Vietnam War, others to Cold War prestige. But the motive most often ascribed to NASA is money. Certainly, NASA swindled multi-billions of dollars from the U.S. taxpayer. The money swindled was certainly profitable for those behind the moon landing hoax conspiracy. The real objective was not to gain a short-term profit, but to grow the love of money in the hearts of men as a way to control and enslave the world. The love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6.10 The love for money must be made to grow, and that is the motive behind the moon landing hoax. In order for the root of evil to grow deep into the soil, that soil must be tilled by the lie that there is no God. In order to grow the love for money in men's hearts, men must be convinced that there is no eternal consequences for lying, cheating, and stealing to get money. That requires that men believe that there is no God who can mete out any punishment for sin. That in turn necessitates that man be kept ignorant that he is made by God in God's image on the flat earth which is at the center of his creation. The moon mission serves to beguile men into believing in a godless, endless universe where man is on an insignificant spherical planet careening through space. The key to understanding the moon landing hoax is to realize that it is not scientific deception, it is spiritual deception. Symbolism is important in witchcraft. The NASA logo includes the forked tongue of a serpent to symbolize that it is under the control of the great serpent, Satan. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, 9. It is significant that the NASA moon missions were named Apollo. Apollo is the Greek sun god. Apollo is often depicted riding on a horse-drawn chariot with the sun shining behind him. Notice in the Apollo 13 emblem, Apollo himself is not seen. The depiction seems to be of the horses coming from Earth. However, there is no chariot. In view of the missing chariot, the horses could be interpreted as drawing the Earth behind it, which suggests that the Earth itself is the chariot of Apollo. Satan is described in the Bible as the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, who blinds the minds of the lost to the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Apollo is the same Apollyon referenced in Revelations as the angel of the bottomless pit. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Revelation 9, 11. 
The Edinburgh Encyclopedia states, quote, On this passage, Hansius makes the following observation. There can be no doubt that the Pythian Apollo is the same as the Ab in Abaddon of the Hebrews, which the Greeks translated literally as Apollyon. Close quote. In Wakeman Reno's Amen, the god of the Ammonians, or a key to the mansions in heaven, he states that the reference to Apollyon in Revelation 9-11 is a reference to Apollo, who is Satan. Quote, Satan, Belial, Lucifer, Abandon, and Apollyon are all one in the same. The sun, Apollo, in the sign of the scorpion, the king of the bottomless pit. The god of Freemasonry is Lucifer. So it is not surprising that Masonic-influenced NASA would name its moon missions after the Masonic god, Apollo, Lucifer. The NASA Apollo missions were central to conditioning the world into believing the lie of a spinning, spherical Earth orbiting the Sun. Tex Mars summarizes the Masonic beginnings and the Satanic aims of NASA. Quote, NASA's space program has from the start been founded on the principles of Masonic alchemy and the magic of the mystery religions of the ancients. The prophet Daniel told us that the last day's world ruler, the Antichrist King, would be mighty, quote, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper craft as in witchcraft, the earliest beginnings of the U.S. space program involved the secretive OSS CIA project Operation Paperclip in which Nazi rocket scientists like Werner von Braun were brought from war-torn Germany to America and given responsibility for development of space vehicles. The Freemasons were then put in charge of the newly created space agency, and magic and witchcraft were integrated and wedded with the newest advances in technology. Virtually everything that NASA does is permeated with magic and alchemy. Moreover, the real purpose of NASA is contained in another matrix, hidden from the public at large. This process involves the creation of satanic ritual magic, enabling the Illuminati elite to acquire and accumulate power, even as the mind-controlled and manipulated masses are pushed into ever-increasing states of altered consciousness." Close quote. Freemasonry is the child of the Jewish Kabbalah. Freemasonry, at the highest levels, is under Zionist control, which means that NASA is ultimately under Zionist control. In witchcraft, there are double meanings to acronyms and words. NASA is, of course, an acronym for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. NASA is also a Hebrew word that means to lift up, to carry off, or to exalt oneself. The Hebrew word NASA 
additionally means to cause to bear iniquity. The Zionist influence within NASA is well hidden. There are, however, indications of Zionist influence within NASA. One example is the Columbia Shuttle Mission STS-107 emblem. The Space Shuttle Mission STS-107 was a disastrous mission during which the Columbia Shuttle was destroyed when it allegedly re-entered the atmosphere on February 1, 2003. It is the proper protocol for a commemorative emblem to display the flag of the host country along with the flag of a guest astronaut's country. The Columbia Shuttle Mission STS-107 emblem was notable for its glaring breach of proper protocol in that it displayed only the flag of the guest astronaut's country without displaying the flag of the host country, which was the United States. What country was the guest astronaut from? He was from Israel. The presence of the flag of Israel on the Columbia Shuttle Mission STS-107 emblem, without also including the flag of the United States, was intended as a not-so-subtle symbol of Israeli hegemony over NASA and the United States government. The inclusion of the flag of Israel and the exclusion of the U.S. flag is a portent of things to come. Israel will ultimately stab the U.S. in the back. Before Israel does that, it will milk the U.S. for all it can. Indeed, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was overheard by a CIA agent saying to his supporters after visiting Jonathan Pollard's jail cell that, quote, once we squeeze all we can out of the United States, it can dry up and blow away, close quote. Pollard is a Jewish spy who was caught spying on the U.S. for Israel. Rafi Itan, who is a Mossad spy master, an advisor to Fidel Castro, and an Israeli cabinet minister, told one of Israel's largest daily newspaper, Yadiat Aranat, in June 1997, quote, I failed in the Pollard affair, just as I failed in other intelligence operations beyond enemy lines, close quote. Itan's statement indicates that Israel considers the United States an enemy. For more information on the duplicity of Israel, read this author's book, 9-11, Enemies, Foreign and Domestic. NASA and the Israel Space Agency, ISA, for a long time have had a very close working relationship. For example, in 1986, NASA and ISA entered into a formal agreement to share technology. That agreement is the means by which massive amounts of highly sensitive technology developed by NASA at taxpayer expense is handed over to Israel. Interestingly, the American-Israeli Cooperative Enterprise revealed that in October 1999, Ben-Gurion University researchers joined an international project to map the Earth sponsored by NASA 
the German space agency, DARA, and the Italian space agency, ASI. Certainly, that earth mapping project is all part of the international effort to conceal the flat earth. The alleged NASA Curiosity rover mission to Mars in November 2011 is claimed by Israel to have included an Israeli manufactured refrigerator. Israel is interested in obtaining technology from NASA and NASA is all too obliging. That explains, for example, Israel's hosting of the 2015 International Astronautical Conference, IAC, which was held in Jerusalem. At that conference, Israel announced yet another partnership between the Israel Space Agency, ISA, and NASA, which involves, quote, joint missions, personnel and scientific data exchanges, ground-based research facilities. The technology sharing agreements with the U.S. are on their face bilateral, but in fact are one-sided. Make no mistake about it, Israel has advanced technology, but it has very little to share with the U.S. Virtually all of Israel's technology has been given to it by or stolen from another country, usually the U.S. Israel, however, does share technology obtained from the U.S. with other like-minded countries. There has been a long, albeit secretive, history of mutual cooperation between communist China and Israel in the development of nuclear and other military weapons. In fact, Israel has been cited as one of the primary conduits for the flow of U.S. and other Western technologies to communist China. No one who is a patriotic American would ever enter into the one-sided technology sharing agreements with Israel. The one-sided agreements were ratified by NASA officials because Israel controls NASA. Masonic officials at NASA simply go along with whatever Israel wants. Israel Space Agency is not truly a space agency. It is an intelligence agency whose purpose is to obtain as much U.S. technology as it can get. The technology sharing agreements between the NASA and ISA are in reality technology handover agreements where U.S. advanced technology is delivered to Israel. For a more complete explanation of Israel's hegemony over the U.S. government, read this author's book, Bloody Zion. I am reading from The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe by Edward Hendry. Chapter 18 in the third edition, Map of the Flat Earth. Most have a difficult time understanding the flat earth because since childhood they have been conditioned by the ubiquitous depiction of the earth as a globe. The first scientific object displayed to them in the classroom was typically a globe of the earth. They have been instructed in their early lessons of world history about how Magellan circumnavigated the globe. 
Once one sees just how the flat earth truly exists, it will be easy to understand how Magellan could be believed to have circumnavigated the globe when in fact he simply circumnavigated a plane. In the depiction below, we see that the earth is flat with the North Pole in the center of a circular plane. The South is at all points at the perimeter of the plane. Antarctica actually covers the entire circumference of the Earth plane. The above map is in fact called a polar azimuthal equidistant map. According to the United States Geological Survey, USGS, azimuthal maps are considered to be accurate in displaying continents and oceans. Because of their accuracy, they are used for air and sea navigation. Indeed, the USGS states that the azimuthal equidistant maps are, quote, used by USGS in the National Atlas of the United States of America and for large-scale mapping of Micronesia, useful for showing airline distances from center point of projection, close quote. North is the center of the flat earth and south is a direction emanating out from the North Pole to the outer rim of Antarctica. Thus, longitudinal lines are north-south lines that splay out from the North Pole to the outer rim of Antarctica, much like the spokes on a wheel, with the North Pole being the hub and Antarctica being the rim. East and west are directions circling the North Pole between equidistant points from the North Pole anywhere on the globe. Thus, latitude lines are east-west circles with points equidistant from the North Pole. If you travel east or west at the same latitude, you will eventually circumnavigate the Earth and wind up at your starting point. Circumnavigation does not necessitate that the Earth be a globe. Magellan circumnavigated the flat Earth. Antarctica is the rim of the flat Earth. Upon reaching Antarctica, explorers are first met with a massive ice wall that is between 1,000 and 2,000 feet thick, with 100 to 200 feet of that thickness rising above the water. One of the first explorers to see the Antarctic ice wall was Sir James Clark Ross, a British naval officer and polar explorer. Ross was confronted with a sheer cliff of ice, perfectly level on top, that he estimated to be between 150 and 200 feet high, extending east and west as far as the eye could see. Ross famously described the Antarctic ice wall, quote, it was an obstruction of such character as to leave no doubt in my mind as to our future proceedings, for we might as well sail through the cliffs of Dover as to penetrate such a mass. It would be impossible to conceive a more solid looking mass of ice, not the smallest appearance of any rent or fissure could we discover throughout its whole extent, and the intensely bright sky beyond it but too plainly indicated the great distance to which it reached southward." Close quote. The USGS admits that the azimuthal equidistant map is accurate for all distances 
and directions from the center point on the map. The USGS, however, claims that the map is only accurate when the starting point is from the center of the map. In the above map of the flat earth, therefore, the USGS admits that all distances and directions from the North Pole to anywhere on the map traveling south are accurate, but claims it is not necessarily accurate when starting from any other point on the map other than the North Pole. Notice the similarity between the UN flag logo below and the Flat Earth map. The only thing that the UN left off the flag is Antarctica. The skeletal world government set up to enslave the world knows that the Earth is flat and they have hidden their flat earth secret in plain view. Notice also the number of sections in the UN flag logo. There are exactly 33 sections, which correlates nicely with the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. One might wonder, where is the equator? In the azimuthal equidistant map below, the equator, Tropic of Cancer, and Tropic of Capricorn are all clearly labeled. Below is a polar azimuthal equidistant standard map of the world from 1892. Obviously, the globe model presents the traveler with a significantly different configuration than does the flat earth model, particularly in the so-called, quote, southern hemisphere, close quote. The discrepancy between the reality of a flat earth and the myth of a globe have found many a seafarer off course as they traveled the South Seas. Samuel Robotham explains the dangers of the false charts based upon a globe model. Quote, In the Southern Hemisphere, navigators to India have often fancied themselves east of the Cape when still west and have been driven ashore on the African coast, which, according to their reckoning, lay behind them. This misfortune happened to a fine frigate, the Challenger, in 1845. How came Her Majesty's ship Conqueror to be lost? How have so many other noble vessels, perfectly sound, perfectly manned, perfectly navigated, been wrecked in calm weather, not only in a dark night or in a fog, but in broad daylight and sunshine, in the former case upon the coast, in the latter upon sunken rocks, from being, quote, out of reckoning, close quote, under circumstances which until now have baffled every satisfactory explanation, close quote. Robotham explains how the British ship Challenger completed the circuit of the southern region, indirectly, to be sure, circumnavigating Antarctica. The approximate circumference of Antarctica is supposed to be approximately 14,460 statute miles on the globular Earth model. However, the Challenger spent three years and traversed nearly 69,000 miles. That is a distance that would have allowed the ship to circle Antarctica over four times if the Earth were in fact a globe. The 69,000 mile long journey around the circumference of the Earth that is Antarctica, however, is perfectly explained by a flat earth.
Robotham quotes from voyagers who found that their charts, which used a globular Earth model, almost always put them off course in the South Seas. Quote, We found ourselves every day from 12 to 16 miles by observation in advance of our reckoning. Close quote. Another southern seafarer stated, quote, By our observations at noon, we found ourselves 58 miles to the eastward of our reckoning in two days. Close quote. The spherical earth charts did not account for the expanse of distance between the lines of longitude the further south one travels on a flat earth. Consequently, the mariner's true position on the earth, determined by using celestial navigation and a chronometer, was found to be off by several degrees from the position on the chart that was plotted using dead reckoning. One mariner detailed the distance that the erroneous charts, which assumed a globular earth, put them off course in the South Seas. February 11, 1822, at noon, in latitude 65.53 south, our chronometers gave 44 miles more westing than the log in three days. On 22nd of April, 1822, in latitude 54.16 south, our longitude by chronometers was 46.49 and by dead reckoning, 47 degrees 11 minutes. On 2nd May, 1822, at noon, in latitude 53.46 south, our longitude by chronometers was 59 degrees 27 minutes and by dead reckoning 61 degrees 6 minutes. On October 14th, in latitude 58.6, longitude by chronometers 62 degrees 46 minutes, by account 65 degrees 24 minutes. In latitude 59.7 south, longitude by chronometers was 63 degrees 28 minutes, by account 66 degrees 42 minutes. In latitude 61.49 south, latitude by chronometers was 61 degrees 53 minutes, by account 60 degrees 38 minutes. The skippers of the ships in the South Seas could only guess that the discrepancies between their dead reckoning plotted on their charts and their true positions, confirmed by precise chronometers and sextants, was due to the currents. Robotham explains, however, that currents could not possibly account for the navigation errors because the errors in the navigation were manifested regardless of whether the ships were traveling east or west. The commander of the United States Exploring Expedition, Lieutenant Wilkes, in his narrative says that in less than 18 hours he was 20 miles to the east of his reckoning in latitude 54 degrees 20 minutes south. He gives other instances of the same phenomenon, and in common with almost all other navigators and writers on the subject, attributes the differences between the actual observation and theory to currents, the velocity of which at latitude 57 degrees 15 minutes south amounted to 20 miles a day. The commanders of these various expeditions were, of course, with their education and belief in the Earth's rotundity, unable to conceive of any other cause for the differences between log and chronometer results 
than the existence of currents. But one simple fact is entirely fatal to such an explanation, namely that when the route taken is east or west, the same results are experienced. The water of the southern region cannot be running in two opposite directions at the same time, and hence, although various local and variable currents have been noticed, they cannot be shown to be the cause of the discrepancies so generally observed in high southern latitudes between time and log results. The conclusion is one of necessity, is forced upon us by the sum of the evidence collected that the degrees of longitude in any given southern latitude are larger than the degrees in any latitude nearer to the northern center, thus proving the already more than sufficiently demonstrated fact that the earth is a plane having a northern center in relation to which degrees of latitude are concentric and from which degrees of longitude are diverging lines continually increasing in their distance from each other as they are prolonged toward the great glacial southern circumference. Below is a map depicting the path of the sun and moon. They would progress in their path from the Tropic of Cancer for the summer months in the north, the winter months in the south, to the Tropic of Capricorn for the winter months in the north, the summer months in the south. The governments of the world want the masses to believe that the world is round. However, when governments want to know how to address issues on the real configuration of the world, they reference a polar equidistant azimuthal flat earth map. Indeed, the U.S. military employs hundreds of soldiers and civilians in producing accurate maps of areas of deployment. Those maps are almost never made public. Below is a frame from an official video tour of the White House Situation Room, published by the White House and posted on the Internet, showing a polar projection of an azimuthal equidistant map in the White House Situation Room. When it really counts, the U.S. government wants to know the real configuration of the Earth a flat earth. Chapter 20 of The Greatest Lie on Earth Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe by Edward Hendry Scientific Proof The Earth Does Not Move Many attempts were made to prove that heliocentricity was true and geocentricity was false. Every such attempt has been a failure. The most famous, because of its precision and irrefutability, was the experiment done by physicist A. A. Mitchelson, 1852-1931 and chemist E. W. Morley, 1838-1923. through 1923. The Mitchelson-Morley experiment, using an interferometer which measured light rays, established that the Earth is stationary. Mitchelson was involved in other experiments that confirmed, to his dismay, that the Earth is stationary. The Mitchelson-Morley experiment, 1887, does not stand alone. 
it is joined in its confirmation of a stationary Earth by the James Bradley experiment, 1729, proving that the ether is not carried along by the Earth, the Sagnac experiment, 1913, proving that there was in fact an ether, the Mitchelson-Gale experiment, 1925, proving that the ether passed over the Earth once every 24 hours, and Aries failure, 1871, proving that the stars moved, carried by the ether, while the Earth remained stationary. There are many other experiments that have each time given results that were not only consistent with a stationary Earth, but indicative of a stationary Earth. From the light polarization experiments of E. Muscart in 1872 to the mutual inductance experiments of Theodore de Coudres in 1889 to the 1903 Teuton Noble experiments. Indeed, there is not a single experiment that proves that the Earth moves. The moving Earth is based entirely on a theory and is contradicted by all of the experimental evidence. The Sagnac experiment proving the existence of ether destroys the theory of relativity, which necessarily assumes that there is no ether. The Mitchelson-Gale experiment proved that the ether passed over the Earth once every 24 hours, but it did not prove whether it was the ether moving or the Earth spinning. Aries' failure determined with scientific certainty that in fact it was the ether carrying the stars that was moving over the earth and that the earth was stationary. Dr. Neville Thomas Jones, Ph.D., explains that George Airy proved that the world was stationary and the stars are moving. Because his experiment proved that the earth does not move, which was the opposite of the expected outcome, Aries' experiment is commonly known as Aries' failure. There has been a virtual blackout, however, within science education of these experiments. Dr. Malcolm Bowden reveals that he asked three Christian physicists if they had ever heard of them. Not one had. Indeed, in March 2005, another physicist wrote to Dr. Bowden that, quote, after 35 years as a professional physicist with a thesis in relativity, I only learned of Sagnac's experiment last year, close quote. The degree of the cover-up of true science is simply astounding. The Mitchelson-Morley experiment was simple in concept. A light beam was split. One of the split beams was sent at a right angle to the Earth's supposed direction of travel, and the other was sent along the path of the Earth's supposed direction of travel. The light traveling in the direction of the Earth's travel should have taken longer than the light traveling at right angles to the Earth's direction of travel. To the amazement of the scientific world, the results were null, meaning that there was no difference in the speed of the light beams. That meant that the Earth was motionless. The Mitchelson-Morley experiment shook the scientific world. The implications were devastating for the Copernican model of a globular, spinning Earth 
orbiting around the sun. If the heliocentric model fell, then evolution would not be far behind. The priests of science knew that something had to be done if they were going to maintain their godless religion. In desperation, the priests of science tried to explain away the null result of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment. Hendrik A. Lorenz and George Fitzgerald swallowed their pride and put their formerly good names to a ridiculous theory that the null result in the Mitchelson-Morley experiment was because the solid steel arm that was pointed in the direction of the supposed motion of the Earth became shorter due to the Earth's movement through the ether. That shortening of the steel caused the light to arrive at the same time, not because the Earth was stationary, but because the Earth was moving. Seriously, I'm not making this up. This supposed contraction became known as the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction. There was absolutely no evidence to support the theory of the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction, but it was all they had to try to keep the spinning and orbiting Earth model of heliocentricity alive. They only came up with the theory of the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction because they had nothing else to explain the null result and they were not going to abandon the Copernican model. Some scientists aver that it is a misnomer to call the Lorentz Fitzgerald theory a contraction since as first theorized it was supposedly the transverse arm of the Mitchelson-Morley interferometer that was lengthened, so it should actually be called the Lorentz Fitzgerald expansion. Regardless, if it was called an expansion or a contraction, it was an inane theory that was unsupported by any proof. Arthur Miller described the Lorentz Fitzgerald contraction as physics of desperation. Indeed, it was more akin to a fairy tale for adults than it was science. It was not long before Einstein was pressed into service with his theory of relativity. Notice that the scientific community rejected acceptance of a stationary earth not because there was any scientific evidence that contradicted it, but because it had become the central faith of the godless scientific community. The Copernican theory was simply not to be abandoned, no matter what the scientific evidence showed. This is a reading from the 21st chapter of the book, The Greatest Lie on Earth, Proof That Our World Is Not a Moving Globe, by Edward Hendry. Einstein to the rescue. Something had to be done about the results of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment. The high priests of science simply could not allow the world to discover that the earth did not move. Enter Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity. Einstein announced his special theory of relativity in 1905 and his general theory of relativity in 1915. Einstein's theory of relativity was able to explain away the null results of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment. According to Einstein, the speed of light is constant, and consequently, an object moving through space would not show movement if light was used to measure the speed of the motion. According to Einstein, the speed of light is constant 
for every observer, no matter what speed the observer is traveling. Armed with the theory of relativity, scientists argued that the Earth was moving despite the null result of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment. They alleged that it was incorrectly shown not to be moving in the Mitchelson-Morley experiment because the light used in the experiment, which was expected to show the speed of the Earth through the ether, could neither increase nor decrease in speed. The Mitchelson-Morley experiment was designed to measure the expected speed of the supposedly moving Earth through the ether. Einstein could not have a constant speed of light as he theorized if there was an ether. Einstein solved that issue by simply announcing that there was no ether. Einstein, by theorizing that there is a constant speed of light and there is no ether, solved the Mitchelson-Morley null movement result and saved the heliocentric model of an orbiting, rotating Earth. Light travels in waves, which is a fact that Einstein accepted. A wave needs a medium through which to travel. Imagine a wave in water without the water. It is an impossibility. The medium through which light travels is called ether. This simple law of physics that a wave needs a medium through which to travel is something that is easy to understand. The corollary of an ether for light to travel through, however, will seem foreign to the reader because it is not taught in schools. The educational system has been given over completely to the mystical theory of relativity, where the ether is simply not allowed to exist. Einstein removed the ether from existence by edict. The problem is that a wave of light cannot exist without a medium for that light. Professor Herbert Dingle explains the absurdity of light waves without an ether through which to travel. Light consisted of vibrations in that ether that had physical properties which also were, in principle, determinable. What Einstein was proposing, therefore, was to retain the finite velocity of light without the existence of any standard with respect to which that velocity had a meaning. Light consisted of waves with a definite length frequency, and velocity in nothing. It was the grin without the Cheshire cat. The physical part of the theory was expendable. Only the equations needed to be saved. Einstein saw a way of saving the equations and did not consider it worthwhile to, quote, explain light. Einstein was satisfied to, quote, explain it in terms of things that we understood nothing of. In other words, not to explain it at all. If his assumptions were granted, he did save the equations. And when his theory ultimately made its general impact on the world, mathematics had so dominated physics that the non-existence of the Cheshire Cat was regarded as a triviality. The grin remained, and all was well. Einstein's construct of, quote, no ether, close quote, is an impossibility, just as a wave in water without the water is an impossibility. In any event, Einstein was proven wrong and the ether was proven to exist in the 1913 Sagnac experiment. 
That experiment proves scientifically, beyond any doubt, that there is, in fact, an ether through which light travels. Indeed, airlines today use cockpit, ring, laser, gyroscopic compasses that are based upon the discovery by George Sagnac of fringe changes in light traveling through the ether. The changes in the fringes of light is then computed into a reading which tells the pilot about changes in bearing of the airplane. Without an ether, those sophisticated optical compasses would not work at all. The very existence of the laser gyroscopic compasses used by airplanes today proves that there is an ether and impeaches Einstein's claim that there is no ether. The existence of ether destroys the theory of relativity and establishes the Michelson-Morley experiment as proving that the Earth is stationary. Einstein removed the ether, which upended the traditional laws of physics. Einstein did not present any proof that there was no ether. He just made it up. Removing the ether was a way of explaining why Michelson-Morley's interferometer showed no motion of the earth. Removing the ether removed the resistance of ether to light waves, which allowed Einstein to conjure the myth that light will not change speed on a moving surface. That explained away the Michelson-Morley results showing that Earth did not move. If, however, there is an ether, that necessarily means that the Earth is stationary, as proven in the Michelson-Morley experiment. The theory of relativity is a complete lie. It is based entirely on convoluted and deceptive mathematical models. Nikola Tesla's statement about the modern methods of scientists like Einstein is revealing. Quote, Today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments, and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. Close quote. Professor Herbert Dingell was once an eminent proponent of the theory of relativity. He later realized that it was simply a myth, supported not by scientific experiments, but rather by false math formulae. He discovered that the theory of relativity is held to be true not because it is true, but because mathematical formulae were devised and held up as evidence of its truth. Quote, Not only are hypotheses held to contain the, quote, real truth, it is now claimed that any mathematical hypothesis is necessarily true. The problem with basing proof for a scientific theory solely on mathematics is that a mathematical equation may not correspond to reality. A mathematical formula may only prove something that is imaginary and not real. Professor Dingle explains, quote, the symbols that compose a mathematical expression may, with equal mathematical correctness, correspond both to that which is observable and that which is purely imaginary or even unimaginable. If, therefore, 
we start with a mathematical expression and infer that there must be something in nature corresponding to it, we do, in principle, just what the pre-scientific philosophers did when they assumed that nature must obey their axioms. But its immensely greater power for both good and evil makes the consequences of its misapplication immensely more serious. The experiments supporting the theory of relativity were, quote, thought experiments performed completely through complicated math formulae designed to bedazzle ignorant laymen. Professor Dingle stated, Mathematics has been transformed from the servant of experience into its master, and instead of enabling the full implications and potentialities of the facts of experience to be realized and amplified, it has been held necessarily to symbolize truths which are in fact sheer impossibilities but are presented to the layman as discoveries. Dr. Dingle reveals the key point that is the cornerstone of the theory of relativity Many highfalutin scientists do not seem to know this one simple fact. Quote, In the language of mathematics, we can tell lies as well as truths. And within the scope of mathematics itself, there is no possible way of telling one from the other. That is the dirty secret behind the theory of relativity. Einstein used mathematics to tell lies. The only way to determine if a mathematical formula has any validity is to test it in the real world. Dr. Dingle explains that, quote, we can distinguish them only by experience or by reasoning outside the mathematics applied to the possible relation between the mathematical solution and its supposed physical correlate. Physical experiments are not something that have been done with much success in proving the theory of relativity. Consequently, scientists resort to thought experiments using mathematical formulae which have no correlation to reality. How can math be used to tell lies, as alleged by Professor Dingle? A simple example will illustrate how math can be used to support a falsehood. If one were to say that a glass that is half empty is the same as a glass that is half full, that would be true. One can use mathematics, however, to make that simple truth be the foundation for a falsehood. Let's put the half-full glass equaling the half-empty glass into equation, where E represents an empty glass and F represents a full glass. One-half E equals one-half F. That equation 1 half E equals 1 half F is accurate as it is presented. A half empty glass is equal to a half full glass. Now, in basic algebra, if one multiplies both sides by the same number, it does not affect the accuracy of the equation. Thus, to multiply both sides of the equation by 2, one would get the result of E equals F. Under the rules of algebra, that is supposed to be a true statement. We know, however, that in reality, an empty glass does not equal a full glass. Thus, in reality, E does not equal F. However, 
mathematics can be used to present a falsehood as truth. E equals F. That is the type of unreal reasoning that permeates the theory of relativity, where the scientific testing is done in thought experiments using mathematics. This creates a fantasy world of relativity. The theory of relativity is not science. It is mysticism, supported only by mathematical models. Physicists gave up trying to understand the absurd results of the formula used to explain the theory of relativity and simply capitulated without much of a fight. They accepted the mathematical formulae of Einstein, even though they often gave inaccurate and incongruous solutions. Dingle explains that, quote, with the apparent success in 1919 of Einstein's general theory with its then quite new and terrifying mathematical machinery of tensor calculus came the fatal climax. Physicists gave up trying to understand the whole business and surrendered the use of their intelligence and accepted passively whatever apparent absurdities the mathematicians put before them. Einstein's biographer, Ronald Clark, reports that Einstein's friend, Janos Plesch, suggested to Einstein that there seemed to be some connection between mathematics and fiction. Einstein replied, quote, There may be something in what you say. When I examine myself, in my methods of thought, I come to the conclusion that the gift of fantasy has meant more to me than my talent for absorbing positive knowledge. Close quote. The theory of relativity is not science. It is fantasy conjured by mathematical formulae in the minds of Einstein and his followers. The blind faith of the scientific community in the supposed truth of the theory of relativity and its intolerance for any evidence of its invalidity is akin to adherence in a religious cult. When one realizes that relativity is more a religion than it is science, it explains while the ascension of relativity is in direct portion to the descent of Christianity in society. It seems that there is more tolerance in religion than there is in the scientific community toward heterodoxy, especially when it comes to the theory of relativity. Indeed, Professor Dingle said as much, quote, it is ironical that in the very field in which science has claimed superiority to theology, for example, in the abandoning of dogma and the granting of absolute freedom to criticism, the positions are now reversed. Science will not tolerate criticism of special relativity, while theology talks freely about the death of God, religionless Christianity, and so on, on which I make no comment whatever. Unless scientists can be awakened to the situation into which they have lapsed, the future of science and civilization is black indeed. Charles Lane Poor professor of celestial mechanics at Columbia University and the author of a number of standard textbooks on astronomy stated that, quote, the relativity theory strikes directly at our fundamental concepts as to the structure of the universe. Its conclusions are startling and completely upsetting to our common sense way of looking at physical and astronomical phenomena. 
close quote. Dr. Lewis Essen, a distinguished mathematician and fellow of the Royal Society, stated that the theory of relativity was not truly a physical theory, but rather simply a number of sometimes contradictory assumptions. Lord Ernest Rutherford is considered the father of nuclear physics. So eminent was he that chemical element 104 was named Rutherfordium after him. Lord Rutherford has called the theory of relativity simply, quote, nonsense. In 1922, Professor Herbert Dingle wrote Relativity for All, one of the first standard textbooks on the theory of relativity. His second book on the subject, written approximately 20 years later, The Special Theory of Relativity, remained for a long time the standard work in English and American universities on the theory of relativity. Indeed, Professor Dingle was one of the foremost experts on the theory of relativity in the world. During a span of 50 years, he studied the theory intensively and conferred about it with all the physicists who were experts in it. Einstein, Eddington, Tolman, Whitaker, Schrodinger, Born, and Bridgman. So renowned was Dingle's expertise on the theory of relativity that when Einstein died in 1955, the BBC chose Professor Dingle to broadcast a tribute to Einstein. In 1959, after years of believing and promoting the theory of relativity, Dingle realized that something was wrong. He found a paradox in the theory of relativity. He spent 13 years canvassing his large network of scientists to try to find an answer to the paradox. Nobody could answer the paradox. He tried to publish the paradox, but was refused all access to scientific journals. Finally, in 1972, Dingle decided to publish his conclusion in a book titled Science at the Crossroads. He explained in his book that he only published it because he was denied access to scientific journals to present his evidence. In that book, Professor Dingle presents unimpeachable proof that the theory of relativity is invalid. In order to understand the paradox with which Professor Dingle was faced, some explanation should be given. The coup de grace to the Mitchelson-Morley experiment results showing that the Earth does not move is the central maxim of relativity theory that there is no way to tell which of the two bodies is in motion. The theory of relativity provides that motion is relative to the observer. Thus from Earth it would appear that the Sun is moving. However, from the perspective of the Sun, the Earth is moving. According to the theory of relativity, there is no way to establish which is the case because the movement of the two bodies is only movement relative to the other body. This maxim of relativity effectively kills the null result of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment since, according to the theory of relativity, the null result was only a matter of relative perspective. Under the theory of relativity, if you were to fall on your face, it cannot be said that you fell to the ground. It is equally likely that the earth rose up to meet your face. That is the kind of silly conclusion brought about by the theory of relativity. 
In addition to the above relativity of motion, Einstein theorized that time slows down the faster one travels. For example, if a twin, Paul, takes a trip on a spaceship at near the speed of light and he returns to Earth ten years later, his twin brother, Peter, left back on Earth, will have aged ten years, but the twin on the spaceship would only have aged very little. The problem with that postulation from Einstein is that under the theory of relativity, the movement of each brother is relative. Each twin sees the other as moving, and therefore each brother should have aged more slowly than the other brother. The conclusion under the theory of relativity is that Peter has aged more slowly than Paul, and at the same time, Paul has aged more slowly than Peter. Of course, it is impossible for each twin to age more slowly than the other twin. The twin paradox is chosen by this author because it very simply illustrates the issue. Professor Dingle, however, never actually used the twin paradox because there is an alleged quirk in that example that gives the supporters of the theory of relativity an out, or so they allege. They assert that there is no symmetry since the twin on the spaceship is traveling outbound and inbound, which involves two inertial frames. Of course, that is pure sophistry, and addressing such nonsense is beyond the scope of this book. Professor Dingle was too well versed in the theory of relativity to allow the promoters of relativity such an easy out, so he steered clear of using the aging twins example. He, instead, used an example of two clocks moving in the same trajectory at different speeds. Professor Dingle asked scientists all over the world to assist him in finding an answer to the paradox using speeding clocks, with one clock traveling faster than the other in the same direction. Every scientific journal in the world refused to even address the paradox that Dingle raised. No one could resolve the paradox, and the scientific community seemed to think it was impolite to even discuss it. Quote, I can present the matter most briefly by saying that a proof that Einstein's special theory of relativity is false has been advanced and ignored, evaded, suppressed, and indeed treated in every possible way except that of answering it by the whole scientific world. Close quote. In science, a paradox is a self-contradictory conclusion that is logically impossible. A theory that causes a logically impossible result is necessarily wrong. A paradox in the theory of relativity simply had to be suppressed by the high priests of science. Professor Dingle laid out the paradox, which has never been resolved to this day, as follows. Quote, According to the theory, if you have two exactly similar clocks, A and B, and one is moving with respect to the other, they must work at different rates, i.e., one works more slowly than the other. But the theory also requires that you cannot distinguish which clock is the, quote, moving one. It is equally true to say that A rests while B moves and that B rests while A moves. The question therefore arises, how does one determine consistently with the theory which clock works more slowly? Unless this question is answerable, the theory unavoidably requires that A works more slowly than B and B more slowly than A, which it requires 
no super intelligence to see is impossible. Now, clearly, a theory that requires an impossibility cannot be true, and scientific integrity requires, therefore, either that the question just posed shall be answered, or else that the theory shall be acknowledged to be false. But, as I have said, more than 13 years of continuous effort have failed to produce either response. Professor Dingle concludes that, quote, the magical influence of this word, relativity, has transformed science in this field into a superstition as powerful as any to be found in primitive tribes. Close quote. We have it on the authority of Professor Dingle, one of the foremost experts on the theory of relativity, that the theory of relativity is false. Neville Martin Gwen describes the irrationality that is woven through the warp and woof of the theory of relativity. Quote, the concept of relativity attached to Einstein's name and propagated by him represents an attack on human reason so insidious and diabolical and so successful that no opportunity of demonstrating its falsity, and not only its falsity, but to anyone prepared to believe his own powers of reason, its blatantly obvious falsity should be allowed to pass. Gwen proves that most of the elements of the theory of relativity were not the discoveries of Einstein. Gwen properly describes them as inventions. Indeed, if one examines the historical record, the only reasonable conclusion is that Einstein plagiarized the entire theory of relativity. Gwen states that, quote, Einstein's works can be searched from beginning to end without revealing a single original thought of real importance. Gwen documents the little-known historical facts that Einstein stole his ideas from other scientists and passed them off as his own. He plagiarized their work. He gave no attribution to the other scientists. Quote, Curved space, for instance, was thought of by Riemann, adding a fourth dimension, that of time to geometry, to create the new concept of space-time, by Minkowski. The doctrine that objects contract in proportion to the speed at which they moved by Fitzgerald and the idea that the velocity of light in a vacuum was constant irrespective of the motion of any object connected with the light ray by Lorentz. Did he, Einstein, first assert the impossibility of detecting the velocity of light through the ether? No, this was done by J. H. Poincaré and H. A. Lorentz. Did Einstein coin the name relativity? No, Poincaré did. It was Poincaré, too, who first asserted that no velocity can exceed that of light. Einstein was not the first to assert that a clock in motion runs slow. This was done by Sir Joseph Larmor. Einstein was not the first to assert that matter is crinkles in curved space. Professor W. K. Clifford advanced this quaint notion in 1870, nine years before Einstein's birth. Did Einstein even invent the famous equation E equals mc squared? which has become almost synonymous with his name, the equation from which nuclear energy and nuclear destruction capability are supposedly derived? Not even that. 
In 1881, J.J. Thompson had produced a formula E equals three quarters mc squared in respect of a charged spherical conductor moving in a straight line. In 1900, Poincaré suggested that electromagnetic energy might possess mass density in relation to energy density, such that E equals mc squared, where E is energy and m is mass. Plagiarization is intellectual theft. The unimpeachable record proves that Einstein was not a genius, but was simply a very clever con man with powerful backers. Gwen concludes that, quote, the truth about Einstein is that he was no more than a puppet, close quote. Gwen presents compelling evidence that Einstein was selected to play the specific role of refuting the Mitchelson-Morley experiment and reestablishing the rotation globular Earth. If Einstein had not existed, another would have been selected to fill his place, for he possessed no qualities which are not available in profusion in almost any place in any age. The obstinate truth about Einstein is that in mathematics he was no more than competent and that among the so-called discoveries presented to the world under his name one can search in vain for one that was original. Had Einstein not been selected for reasons which had nothing to do with his intellectual ability to act out a role which was deemed necessary for the furtherance of the war against God and civilization, his claim to immortal fame would have been that of a talented and not undistinguished physicist, a lifelong Zionist, an occasionally enthusiastic admirer of Stalin's Russia. Einstein was a front man for very powerful interests behind the theory of relativity. That theory was simply an amalgamation of theories propounded by many scientists over many years. As Gwen points out, the global elite needed to have a single frontman for their theory to be popularly accepted. Quote, it is much easier to impose false beliefs on the world if they are personalized. If a theory is put forward without reference to the person who originated it, there will be a tendency for it to be judged on its merits and then, if it clearly has no merits, for it to be rejected. This is far from being the case if a theory, however ludicrously opposed to common sense, is put forward by a man of universally acknowledged genius. When that happens, the tendency will be for the theory to be examined with respect. If it cannot be understood, this will be ascribed to the incapacity of the person examining the theory. If it appears manifestly illogical, it will be assumed that the originator has grasped a logic which is beyond the reach of lesser mortals. In short, it will gradually become accepted on no better grounds than the authority of the person who has advanced it. Close quote. Why was Einstein, of all people, chosen to be the front man? There are very powerful intergenerational interests behind promoting Einstein. These interests have an occult religious agenda to enslave the world. Martin Gwynn identifies the core of the conspiracy as Jewish. That Einstein was a Zionist Jew was probably the qualifying factor that put him at the top of the list to be the mouthpiece for the satanic conspiracy 
to send the scientific world into darkness through the theory of relativity. From the middle of the 19th century onward, those presented to the world as modern geniuses marking the turning points in civilization have been Jews. I do not wish to exaggerate this, and it is certainly true that non-Jews too, such as Darwin at the beginning of the period and Lord Keynes in more recent times, have had their nonsense presented as majestic contributions to human knowledge. Nevertheless, if asked to name the three men whose writings had the greatest influence in shaping the modern world, few would go beyond Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, and Albert Einstein. Explanations for the phenomenon, adequate or otherwise, are suggested elsewhere in other papers that I have written. Here I record only the fact and the inference that can be derived from it. The Jews are entering into what they believe to be their inheritance. If it be accepted that it was desirable to build up the reputation of a single man for the difficult task of imposing relativity on the world and that that man should be a Jew, why was Einstein, out of all the other Jewish scientists available, chosen to play the role assigned to him? One can only speculate. Clearly, his being a Zionist and a communist would have recommended him highly to those who selected him. It seems to be agreed by all who come in contact with him that he had much charm, probably indispensable in the task allotted to him. And eyewitness accounts of his lectures provide evidence of considerable abilities as an actor and a showman, which, for the successful accomplishment of the purpose for which he was used, are talents even more necessary than charm. There must, however, have been many other people with similar or better credentials even in a population restricted to people interested in physics. Failing some revelation by those who chose him, all that can be said is that we need to have little doubt that he earned his duties and his privilege somehow. I have given some indication of what Isaac Newton did to earn the rewards that he received and is still receiving in this world. Those who recall this and take seriously verses 8 and 9 of the fourth chapter of St. Matthew have little alternative to the belief that such fame and adulation as Einstein received in his lifetime and has received since, and which on the face of it are wholly undeserved, must have been earned at the expense of an extremely exacting bargain in respect of his immortal soul. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. After the general acceptance of Einstein's theory of relativity, science entered into a strange new world where experiments were not done using instruments in the physical world, but instead using mathematics in the mind of the scientists. Einstein was famous for announcing new, quote, mind experiments, close quote. Einstein claimed that he did not know of the Michelson-Morley experiment prior to coming up with his special theory of relativity in 1905. Robert Shanklin published an article in 1963 in which he stated that Einstein told him in 1950 that he only became aware of the Michelson-Morley experiment after he had published his paper on special relativity in 1905. Shanklin pointed out that, indeed, Einstein did not mention the Michelson-Morley experiment in his 1905 paper, suggesting by that fact 
that Einstein did not know about the Michelson-Morley experiment. Einstein's claimed ignorance of the Michelson-Morley experiment is contradicted by other statements that he made indicating that, in fact, he did know about the experiment. Einstein is on record admitting that he did, in fact, know about the Michelson-Morley experiment and it played a role in his theory of relativity. Einstein's biographer, Ronald Clark, stated that one of the principal issues for science with the Michelson-Morley experiment was that the experimental results proved that the Earth is stationary. Clark explained the implications of the Michelson-Morley experiment meant that the whole Copernican theory had to be scuttled, which was, quote, unthinkable for the scientific community. Einstein never mentioned the Michelson-Morley experiment in his 1905 paper announcing his theory of special relativity. In 1942, Einstein claimed to Michelson's biographer that he had already become, quote, pretty much convinced of the validity of the relativity principle before I did know this Michelson-Morley experiment and its results, close quote. It seems that Einstein was trying to avoid having anyone connect his theory of relativity with the Michelson-Morley experiment. However, the historical evidence suggests that Einstein was lying. Think about it. How could anyone believe that Einstein would be ignorant of the Michelson-Morley experiment when in fact it was the talk of the entire scientific community? His claimed ignorance simply does not pass the smell test. Regardless, we have proof that Einstein lied when he claimed ignorance of the Michelson-Morley experiment. Forty-two letters were uncovered between Einstein and his fiancée, Milava Mera. Those letters reveal that, in fact, Einstein knew about the Michelson-Morley experiment as early as 1899. In addition, in a recently uncovered 1922 speech that Einstein delivered at Kyoto University in Japan, Einstein admitted that he was aware of the Michelson-Morley experiment and the, quote, strange result, close quote, of that experiment affected directly his theory of special relativity. Quote, while I had these ideas in my mind as a student, I came to know the strange result of the Michelson experiment. Then I came to realize intuitively that if we admit this as a fact, it must be our mistake to think of the movement of the earth against the ether. That was the first route that led me to what we now call the principle of special relativity." Close quote. That speech was translated from Japanese notes and the translation has been criticized by two Japanese academicians. It seems that it is important to many in the scientific field to cast some doubt on whether Einstein knew about the Michelson-Morley experiment. However, there is confirmation that the translation from the Japanese notes is accurate. That confirmation comes in the form of a speech Einstein gave a year before his Kyoto speech, during which Einstein similarly admitted that he knew about the Michelson-Morley experiment before he came up with his theory of special relativity. In May of 1921, during a visit to the University of Chicago, where Michelson was on the faculty, Einstein gave a short speech at the Francis W. Parker School. In that speech, he stated, in pertinent part, 
I thought about whether it would be possible to perceive through some experiment that the earth moves in the ether. But when I was a student, I saw that experiments of this kind had already been made, in particular by your compatriot, Mitchelson. He proved that one does not notice anything on the earth that it moves, but that everything takes place on earth as if the earth is in a state of rest. Close quote. The above 1921 statement by Einstein impeaches his later claims that he did not know about the Mitchelson-Morley experiment. Joran van Dogen draws the ineluctable conclusion from Einstein's 1921 statement that Einstein knew about the Mitchelson-Morley experiment long before he came up with his special theory of relativity and that the Mitchelson-Morley experiments influenced his theory of special relativity. Quote, What does the Parker School lecture imply for our understanding of Einstein's relation to the Mitchelson-Morley experiment and its influence in the creation of the special theory? Taking the text at face value, there can be no doubt that Einstein knew of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment prior to 1905. He attributed a significant role to the ether drift experiments in general and singled out the Mitchelson-Morley experiment for special mention. It further suggests that Einstein had learned of the experiment before becoming convinced of the principle of relativity, contrary to his later recollections. Why was Einstein so insistent in later years in claiming he was ignorant of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment? Because he could not allow there to be any connection made between his theory of relativity and the results of the Mitchelson-Morley experiment. To do so would give up the game. His theory of relativity was trotted out, publicized, and crammed down the throats of academia for the sole purpose of explaining away the Mitchelson-Morley result that proved the earth does not move. Einstein could not allow the world to know that. Hence, he falsely claimed that he did not even know about the Mitchelson-Morley experiment when he devised his theory of relativity. Most people do not know that Einstein was a con artist chosen to play a role. In order for his theory of relativity to maintain its status, however, the powerful elite must also maintain Einstein's esteem as a paragon of intellect. If Einstein is found out to have been a fraud, then his theory of relativity will be scrutinized and found out to be an elaborate scientific deception. Consequently, Einstein has been elevated to the stature of a scientific demigod, and the world's propaganda machine intends to keep him there. For example, Frederick Golden in Time magazine described Einstein as follows, quote, He was the embodiment of pure intellect. He was unfathomably profound. The genius among geniuses who discovered, merely by thinking about it, that the universe was not as it seemed. His ideas, like Darwin's, reverberated beyond science, influencing modern culture. Close quote. What was the occasion for such praise from time? Golden was describing Einstein in the December 31, 1999 Time magazine cover story about him. Einstein had been named Time magazine's Person of the Century 
Think about that for a moment. Albert Einstein was selected as the most influential person from among all the persons who lived during that 20th century. That should give some idea of the importance to which the powerful elite running the world think it is to keep people ignorant of the fact that the earth does not move. That brings to mind the warning of Jesus. Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Luke six twenty six. Apparently, some very powerful interests are very happy about the hoax of Einstein's theory of relativity. These powerful interests are dark and evil. Jewish-controlled Time magazine is owned by one of the largest media conglomerates in the world, Time Warner. The founders of Time magazine were Britton Hayden and Henry Luce, who were both members of the Satanic Secret Society, the Brotherhood of Death, commonly known as the Skull and Bones Society. President George W. Bush, in his autobiography, A Charge to Keep, stated, quote, During my senior year, I joined Skull and Bones, a secret society, so secret I can't say anything more. Close quote. What is so secret that he cannot speak any further about it? The secret is that in return for power, wealth, and fame, he must blindly obey his satanic masters in their antichrist conspiracy to enslave and rule the world. The initiation ceremony for Skull and Bones involves, but is not limited to, the inductees lying naked in a coffin and telling their deepest sexual secrets. Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, in his Satanic Rituals, companion to the Satanic Bible, states that such a coffin ritual is a satanic ritual common in many pagan orders. During the ritual, a powerful spiritual force charges through the participants, transforming their lives dramatically. This powerful spiritual force is a devil. The participants in these ceremonies end up possessed by a devil. Evidence indicates that the Order of Skull and Bones, founded at Yale in 1832, is a chapter of the Illuminati, which was originally founded in 1776 at the University of Ingolstadt in Germany. From this we know that the Skull and Bones is not American at all, but is a branch of a foreign secret society. As with the Jesuits, and the Illuminati. Skull and Bones has many ostensible Gentiles who are members. From this fact, most people have mischaracterized the Skull and Bones as a purely Gentile organization. That is not true. Just as with the Illuminati and the Jesuits, the Skull and Bones is controlled by and serves the interest of Zionist Jews. George W. Bush is a prime example of an ostensible Gentile member of Skull and Bones who acted in the interest of Israel to the detriment of the United States. He was completely controlled by Zionist Jews. The Jewish control of Skull and Bones comes from its roots as a chapter in the crypto-Jewish Illuminati. Some of the practices in terms of the Skull and Bones reveal the Jewish nature of the order. For example, those outside Skull and Bones are referred to by Skull and Bones members as vandals and, quote, Gentiles. Furthermore, in an attempt to conceal the meanings of their writings from any Gentile outsider who may obtain a copy, members of the Skull and Bones often obscure key words by deleting the vowels. 
For example, patriarchs would be written as P-TR-RCHS. Bones would be written as B-N-S. The Hebrew alphabet does not have vowels. They use accent marks, and so Jews are accustomed to writing without using vowels. It is not surprising that they would follow that same practice when trying to conceal the meaning in their writings from the uninitiated Gentile world. The skull and bones use the Hegelian dialectic to change society into a totalitarian state. Under Hegel's dialectic, there must be a conflict, either real or perceived, between a thesis and an antithesis, which is resolved by the synthesis of the two. The secret societies create these conflicts in order to move society regressively away from Christ and Christian principles and toward Satan and Satanic principles. David Bay explains the origin and power behind the Kabbalistic skull and bones. Quote, the Brotherhood of Death Society in the United States is a skull and bones society in Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Its belief structure is identical to that of the Thule Society. Therefore, we can conclude that bonesmen affirm this belief about Jesus Christ, thus condemning them to committing the unpardonable sin. The list of some of the families comprising skull and bones is frightening, for it immediately shows the extent to which America has been influenced by the satanic organization. Remember, the men of these families have likely committed the unpardonable sin. This was quoting from Anthony Sutton, America's Secret Establishment, page 22. Rockefeller family, Standard Oil. Weyerhaeuser family, Lumber. Sloan family, Retailing. Pillsbury family, Flour Milling. J.P. Morgan family, Banking. Taft family, Politics. Bush family, including former President George Bush. Wait a minute, you say. George Bush likely committed the unpardonable sin because of his membership in Skull and Bones? Yes. Now you can see how easy it was for Bush to lead the charge into the satanic New World Order. Now you can see that Bush was far different in his innermost heart than he was on his media-created surface. David Bay mentions Skull and Bones member George H.W. Bush spearheading the satanic New World Order. Indeed, President Bush stated in his State of the Union address before a joint session of the U.S. Congress regarding the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq that, quote, what is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order. President Bush was not leading anything. He was simply an effeminate sycophant who was obedient to his Zionist overlords. A little known fact is that one of the first public mentions of a, quote, new world order was in reference to the worldwide interests of the Jews. The October 6, 1940 issue of the New York Times reported that Arthur Greenwald, member without portfolio in the British War Cabinet, assured the Jews of the United States that when victory was achieved, an effort would be made to found a new world order. The message from Greenwood was delivered by Rabbi Maurice L. Pearlswig chairman of the British section of the Executive Committee of the World Jewish Congress, to Dr. Stephen S. Wise, chairman of the Executive Committee of the World Jewish Congress. Greenwood's message was to the Jews and for the Jews. Greenwood's statement was designed to enlist the powerful Jewish interests in the war with Germany. By making that promise, England had promised the Jews English assistance in gaining Jewish hegemony over a new world order. 
if the Jews would use their enormous resources and influence to deliver the United States into the war against Germany. Indeed, that is exactly what happened. The, quote, New World Order is a world domination by the Jews. It is the goal of the Zionist conspiracy. The Skull and Bone Society is just one of the many occult organizations doing the work of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6, 12. That spiritual truth seems to have been missed by Dr. Dingle. He simply could not understand how and why the clearly fallacious theory of relativity could gain such universal acceptance in the scientific community. Dr. Dingle, in frustration, asked, quote, How is it possible that such an obvious absurdity as the theory of relativity should not only have ever been believed, but should have been maintained and made the basis of almost the whole of modern physics for more than half a century, and that, even when pointed out, its recognition should have been universally and strenuously resisted in defiance of all reason and all the traditions and principles of science. On November 17, 1952, the Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, asked Albert Einstein to accept an invitation to become the President of Israel upon the authorization of the Knesset of Israel. Einstein turned down the offer, but the offer is testimony to the importance and esteem with which Einstein was held among the Jews. It also demonstrates the political importance of the theory of relativity to the Jews. The descent in the minds of men of God who created a flat, immovable earth gives rise to the ascent of Jews in power and influence in the world. Having the earth become one of many millions of planets in the universe, and a rather insignificant one at that, drives from the minds of men any thought that God created a unique earth at the center of his creation and that man is made in his image. Once God is removed from the thoughts of men, it is then possible to introduce ideas of, quote, everything is relative, close quote, where there is nothing inherently good or bad because it is all relative to a person's own ethical opinion. There is no longer reference to absolutes contained in the Bible. Morals become malleable with each man a lawmaker in his own right. So we see that the theory of relativity is a theory that bleeds into all aspects of society. Indeed, read in Psalm 19, verse 1 through 8, how there is a direct correlation between knowledge of God's creation and his commandments. Concealing the glory of God as declared by his handiwork makes it very easy to introduce concepts of relative morality. All manner of sin can then be justified, such as abortion and sodomy. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. 
their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 19.